I start the meeting in open session and can I begin by welcoming members and wishing them all a, a very happy new year. Uh, certainly a very busy uh, new year, no doubt, for particularly Assembly members. Uh, so can I advise members of the need to maintain social distancing during the meeting? Um, I provide a brief overview of today's business. Today the Committee will consider subordinate legislation, briefing by the Minister for Infrastructure on proposals for a motor insurance bill by accelerated passage, general monitoring round and a general update on departmental issues, scrutiny of four transport common frameworks. Uh, members, uh, could I also advise that due to some members joining us remotely, that it would be helpful if members used the hand up icon to register that they wish to ask questions or speak at any agenda item. Also, if members could mute their, mute their mic when they are not speaking, that would allow everyone to hear the evidence and follow the meeting. Could I also advise members that the room must be vacated by 1 p.m. at the latest, to requ and I request that members keep that in mind when asking questions. I am going to ask officials, also, or, or sorry, our, our clerk, etc., to sort of broadly keep in, in broad timing for each briefing session that we get a chance to get through the briefing succinctly. Uh, so, agenda item number one, which is apologies, I have none. Uh, uh, members. And there's none indicating. I think Liz Kimmins has indicated she will be joining, yep. and also George Robinson has indicated that he will be joining as well. Um, okay, agenda item number two, which is chairperson's business. Uh, can I remind members that an online engagement event planned uh, for before Christmas was postponed due to uh, member availability? Are members content to reschedule the event, and, and do members have a preference for a time of the week that would suit best? Perhaps straight after the committee meeting is the best time when members are together. Members agreed with that approach of the committee. Clerks, good. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. And could I also ask uh, to, to the, the clerk that we also, because I've had a number of um, emails from some of the organisations that were meant to be included, uh, just giving them an update as to, to when that will happen, and we're considering that. Okay, members, um, chairperson's business as well. Also, we'll know that today is a sitting day of the assembly, quite uniquely on the Wednesday. Uh, I know v proxy voting arrangements are in place. Uh, and we will, if we do hear division bells, and there is a need for members to vacate, uh, I hope not with the, pro with the proxy arrangements in place. But if there is, if members could bring it up at that point, and we, we will assess the situation. Okay, um, agenda item number three, which is draft minutes. Um, can I turn members' attention to page six of the draft minutes of the meeting on the 15th of December 2021? Are members content with the minutes or a true and accurate reflection of the meeting? Members are agreed. Agreed. Agenda item number four, which is matters arising. Could I turn members' attention to, to page 16, matters arising from the meeting on the 15th uh, of December 2021? And can I ask members if they have any issues to uh, raise from that meeting? I'm not seeing none. Okay, page 18, outstanding uh, committee requests for information as well, and members have no issue. Members, it uh, alluded me to, to, to make comment on uh, chairperson's business, but I will do so when matters are rising. And as a committee, I think we will all we're all touched over the Christmas and New Year period on the tragic deaths of uh, the, Nathan Corrigan, Peter Finnegan, and indeed uh, Peter uh, McNamee. Uh, who died on the, uh, December the 27th in, in a fatal accident uh, on the A5, and I think uh, that story in itself touched a lot of people, particularly uh, over Christmas, and our thoughts and this committee's thoughts and prayers are with the families involved and friends. And I know the issue of the A5 will be something that will be up for debate with the, with the minister, but I think it's poignant that this committee puts on record its sympathies to the families of those affected. Okay. Members, uh, agenda item number five, which is correspondence. Could I draw members' attention uh, to the correspondence memo at page 26 and tabled? At page 29, departmental response providing an update on the review of strategic planning policy on renewable and low-carbon energy. Have members any particular points to raise on that agenda item issue? If not, could I propose that we ask officials to brief the committee on the findings of the consultation on the issue paper? Members content with that approach? Please. Great. Uh, page 58, uh, members uh, will say a response from the Minister for Infrastructure to issues arising from the committee meeting on the 1st of December 2021. Um, members content with that uh, response? I'm not seeing any hands to say contrary to that. 
members will see we will be debating most of those issues uh, during the substantive briefing from the Minister. Okay. Members will see at page 65, uh, obviously we have a restricted paper response from the Minister for Infrastructure uh, to issues regarding DVA enforcement. Uh, members will um, respond accordingly uh, with the Minister in that briefing session. Can I also turn members' attention to page 96, which is a response from the Minister for Infrastructure to issues arising from the committee meeting on the 8th of December. Uh, tabled at page 3, the 8th report of the uh, Examiner of Statutory Rules to the Assembly uh, and the appropriate committees. Could I also advise members of the grants to water and sewage undertakers order Northern Ireland 2022 is referred to in the report uh, with no issues and inform the committee that the debate on the affirmation of the statutory rule is scheduled for 1 p.m. on Monday, the 24th of January. Is the committee content with the actions as suggested in the correspondence memo? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, you know, yes, Andrew. All right. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. J just. Uh, um, Two things. Um, the review of the Planning Act 2011 is referred to within this letter. Um, I'm very conscious of the fact that there's very little left of this mandate and the amount of meetings for this committee. And I just would like to propose we write back to the Department, and some of this would be covered with the Minister, to request that the outcome of this Act and uh, sorry, the outcome of this review um, and the is done before the end of this mandate and officials come to brief us on that because there's a real I have now seen this has drifted massively yeah. and there's a real risk of what's going to happen here is that review won't be completed before the end of this mandate so this committee won't even get sight of the recommendations and have an input. Certainly I would concur with those comments and I think it's an ample time with the Minister to, to, to bring that up but again as an action point I think the committee should be writing to the Minister on that issue as well. So. Yeah. Just, just members one, content with that action point? Yeah, yeah. Yes, Commander. Just, just one other thing. I would declare an interest in me. My stepfather works on the project to upgrade the A6 at the moment. But the, my stepfather works okay. on the project to upgrade the A6. But the next phase, which is not related to this, so it's the next phase, involves the uh, working around the Moboy waste dump. And I know that there's been an update provided in relation to this. Um, I think we as a committee need to get a bit more information about what exactly the plans are to deal with this, because currently what's going to happen is the A6 project is going to be completed in terms of phase one, but there's no, no timescales, no plan for phase two, and I think we need to get a bit more detail about what actually are the timescales for phase two. Happy for that to be raised in both the briefing and uh, in terms of correspondence. Agreed, members? Agreed. Agreed, OK. Um, thank you, members. Uh, we will now move to agenda item number six, which is subordinate legislation, SL1s not subject to assembly procedures or proceedings. Can I advise members that there is one proposal for a statutory rule not subject to assembly proceedings at page 131, SL1, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions, London Dairy Amendment uh, 2022. Are members content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Content? content. Okay. Yes. Agenda item number seven, subordinate legislation, SRs not subject to assembly proceedings. Can I advise members that there is one statutory rule not subject to assembly proceedings at page 142? There has been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was considered by the committee. SR 2021-344, the Taxis 20, or 2008 Act Commencement and Number 6 Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Are members content with the statutory rule? Content. content. Can I advise members uh, that the Minister will attend to discuss a range of business, and I propose that she will brief separately on proposals for accelerated passage followed by questions uh, and then move on to a January monitoring round, the budget uh, 22 to 25, and indeed other issues. And at this stage, we will give officials time uh, and the minister to take their seats. Thank you, Chair. Okay, can, I, can I begin by welcoming um, the Minister and the team to the committee this morning? And for the benefit, Hansard will record the meeting. The briefing by the Minister uh, for, the, for Infrastructure on the proposal for a motor insurance bill and accelerated passage. I did explain to members before uh, the meeting commenced that we're going to tick today's session in very much three distinct parts, starting firstly on the briefing on the motor insurance accelerated passage request followed by the January monitoring round and general budget issues, and finally with current issues. 
So we're going to try and as best to, to keep to that sort of schedule. And if members and indeed officials can, can bear that in mind, because it's a busy session, and I know the minister uh, sure. has give us commitment for time. Hopefully, yeah, what are we Chair, just just to say, um, I've, I've obviously got the um, uh, accelerated passage and the motor vehicle um, compulsory insurance bill, and just speak to that briefly. But what I was going to do is my very short um, introductory statement covers both January monitoring okay. and the future issues. So I was going to suggest if I give that overall, and then we can work through. Yeah, and then we we will we'll work through from a question. On side yes. on the particular okay thank you so uh, ha as i said hansard will record the meeting um, and i could turn members attention to page 152 the clerk's cover memo uh, page 156 the minister's uh, briefing paper uh, page 160 the ministerial uh, briefing paper annex 1 164 comments on the proposals from the consumer council uh, 166 comments on the proposals from motorsport uk 167 proposal uh, comments on the proposals from the MIB Motor Insurers Bureau and 177 comments on the proposal Association of British Insurers. We also have a late correspondence from the Ulster Farmers Union on the proposals. Uh, it has been emailed to members and hard copies are available. So again, I welcome to the meeting uh, Ms Nicola Mallon, Minister for Infrastructure, Katrina Godfrey, Permanent Secretary, Jeremy Logan, Chief Executive of the Driver and Vehicle Agency, and Donald uh, Start uh, Safe and Accessible Travel Division. And again, I think I have Susan Anderson, Director of Finance, either online or with us in person. Oh, she's outside of the meeting. So, okay. I'll now hand over to the to the minister to begin the session. Thank you, Chair, and I want to begin by wishing all the members um, and committee staff a very happy new year. Um, Chair, my officials have already provided comprehensive written briefing on the issue of motor vehicles, compulsory insurance, and the need for accelerated passage. And so, I don't intend to revisit that briefing just now. But I do want to make two very brief points to members. Firstly, my reason for seeking accelerated passage. I can assure members that I have not taken this decision lightly. My preference on this, as in all devolved policy issues, was to fo follow normal assembly procedures for primary legislation. Unfortunately, in this instance, there was insufficient time to progress an assembly bill by the conventional route in the current mandate. For that reason, and also given the complexities around drafting this legislation, I opted to explore the option of inclusion of NI provisions in the Westminster Compulsory Insurance Bill. This would have entailed a legislative consent motion debate in the Assembly. Indeed, we were still pursuing that option just before Christmas. Um, but the very late decision by the Department for Transport Ministers not to include Northern Ireland provisions in the Westminster Bill is regrettable, and I have expressed my disappointment to DFT ministers. It was that decision that has forced me to consider the final and only option open to me in the current mandate, that is, an Assembly Bill by Accelerated Passage. This brings me to my second and final point, Chair, that is the consequences of accelerated passage not being granted. This would mean that until we do amend our legislation, we would have a discrepancy between our domestic legislation and case law. Domestic legislation restricts compulsory insurance to use of motor vehicles on roads and other public places, whereas case law suggests a much wider interpretation. Once the Westminster Bill completes its legislative passage, the corresponding discrepancy in Britain will be removed. This would mean that ultimately the Motor Insurers Bureau here would be vulnerable to claims brought by victims of incidents on private land and potentially to fraudulent claims. Indeed, the making of the Westminster Bill will serve to highlight the continuing discrepancy here in Northern Ireland. This bill, if progressed by accelerated passage, will provide clarity in the marketplace and remove the risk to MIB. If accelerated passage is not granted, the Motor Insurance Bureau will be vulnerable to additional claims, which it is not funded to discharge. Inevitably, this would also result in higher insurance premiums having to be paid by people here in Northern Ireland. I therefore ask the committee to support my request to progress this bill by the accelerated passage procedure. Okay, thanks, Minister. Uh, and we will now go to question session with members. Firstly, can I say I suppose this uh, is an issue that has very much come left of field for the committee at a very late stage. And I understand from reading the briefing paper that there. I understand from listening to the briefing paper. <laughs> this is going to be a case today, I think. Okay. The speaker's going to take the chair. I understand that this is an issue that has come left to fail for the committee, but given the correspondence that there had been considerable 
uh, dialogue between both the department and officials uh, in Westminster on this issue. Uh, so I suppose probably while I can say that uh, as a committee chair and indeed I think broadly as committee members, the committee is supportive of the ultimate aims. Uh, but I would, I would just ask, you know, so obviously the Vanuk judgment in itself, so what is the likelihood of a case being brought? You've mentioned what the likely impact would be, but have, men, have departmental officials looked at the likelihood, therefore, which is, which is really pushed for the desire for accelerated passage rather than going through the normal means? the beginning of a, man, a, a new mandate. What is the likelihood? Yeah, well, I, I can bring Donald in, who's the official who has been working mm -hmm. on this. But if we don't amend our legislation within the current mandate, then there will be a very clear discrepancy uh, in terms of the position here in Northern Ireland and across the water that exposes the Motor Insurance Bureau to the increase um, liability for claims, um, but also fraudulent claims as well. Uh, and we also have to consider the impact on every person here who pays motor insurance, because as a result of the discrepancy, if it's not corrected, that will lead to, and it's estimated to be, £50 increase in people's insurance premiums. Now, that's across GB and NI. But I'm happy to hand over to Donald if he wants to add any further detail to that. Yes, <coughs> it's difficult to gauge the likelihood, Chair, but um, I think one thing we can say with certainty that the likelihood only increases with time. So uh, every month that passes that we, we don't sort of uh, rectify the anomaly, the risk increases. I suppose the other thing is that with the Westminster Bill going through, this draws attention to the anomaly and potentially exposes Northern Ireland as uh, the only area that is uh, vulnerable to, the, I suppose, the worst excesses of the original uh, directive, and that directive is, is being amended even by Europe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I think one of the main concerns that we have, certainly through um, those in which the Consumer Council, Motor Insurance Bureau, and indeed Associated Universities Insurers, Motorsport UK and the Farmers Union have all mentioned their, their real concern regarding increasing consumer costs, as the Minister has mentioned. And that certainly is something of concern to the committee. Just on a more technical nature, and maybe it's Donald that will answer this, uh, will the bill include any delegated powers leading to subordinate legislation? And if so, what aspects of the bill would this relate to? And what type of assembly procedure uh, would they be subject to? No, there will be no subordinate regulations will be required. Really what the bill will do, and it will be a short bill, although it's quite a complex and technical bill, but it simply preserves the status quo. So it ensures that uh, motor insurance in Northern Ireland remains confined, or compulsory insurance remains confined to uh, the use of vehicles and roads and other public places, and it disapplies any case law that might sort of challenge that interpretation. Okay. Should ac accelerated passage be approved, uh, when would the bill come into effect? Uh, what is the earliest date the bill would come into effect? Should it be introduced early in the new mandate through normal assembly procedure? And what would be the likely impact of a delay? So you've sort of touched on the delay aspect of it, um, but in terms of timescales, what would be the difference in, in timing if this had to go through the normal uh, functions? <coughs> uh, with accelerated passage would be through hopefully it would be through in March and then there would be a, a two week um, sorry a two month delay between uh, the final stage and a bill receiving royal assent it's typically six to eight weeks so um, in that scenario would be expecting the bill to become law by May 2022 um, if if we weren't to go if we weren't to go that route and were to go the conventional route, that obviously takes us into the next mandate, uh, and with, with a longer, typically a bill would take nine months to a year minimum to proceed. So, as you can see, that adds considerably to the mm. timeline. What, what considerations has the department given to unintended consequences of the legislation, if any? I think what we're, as I said, there, what the bill really does is preserve the status quo, so it makes sure that nothing changes in domestic law. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that further down the road that consideration couldn't be given to uh, is, is the current statutory provision correct, but it means that any, any consideration is done in a sort of controlled manner. It, it's uh, full consultation. Full, uh, full consideration of the consequences, and really what we're trying to do now is to avoid any unintended consequences. 
Okay. Uh, I'll open up for members. Does any member in particular have a point to raise? Andrew Muir. Oh, sorry. I have, sorry, I you do have, have a list. list. Apologies. Okay. Actually, I'll go kettle boiling first. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. And Apologies. You're very welcome, Minister. Happy New Year to, and year, to the departmental officials. Mr. Just I'll go to yourself first before we go to town. In terms of obviously the LCM, I mean, it's can can you clarify exactly why that process didn't go. I mean, we we've used it here before, whether you believe it or not, or sometimes we need it. But it's it's a wee bit disappointing in terms of of that discussion because I mean. We're trying to work with them, but yeah. So our, our intention was that this was a viable route, and my officials were working with officials. Um, there was a PMB working its way through Westminster, and our understanding was that we could have Northern Ireland provisions included within that. Um, prior to Christmas, I had circulated an executive paper to colleagues outlining that I was taking the LCM route. And then it was only after that that we found out, almost at the last moment, that that was no longer considered to be viable. We understand that it wasn't considered to be viable because ministers didn't want to increase any risk of the bill not being brought forward, so they took a very cautious approach. That then left us with no other option but to be seeking accelerated passage. And I am very disappointed in this approach. Um, I then had to submit um, a, a revised executive paper on the accelerated passage, but I have written to DFT ministers to express my concern because we work we were working with them and it had been our intention to pursue the LCM route and now we're left in this position where we have no other option given the remaining time in the mandate to seek accelerated passage which for me is never ever a preferred way of doing business. No and I asked I asked the question in that context. We know ourselves we're always arguing over accelerated passage in the chamber but I mean in this case I mean because Premier has come out of Westminster this issue, you know what I mean? So um thank you for that answer. Just down, just a couple of points. Obviously, the Motor Insurance Bureau, um, they're stating that the EU and the letter of the state that the EU are, are taking steps to remove the rule. Have you any comment in relation to that? Uh, the the EU are amending the directive, Cahill. Yeah, they they've actually completed that process. And the amended directive directive uh, was adopted in just before Christmas, actually, in December, twenty twenty one, and then member states have two years in which to implement it, though we understand that a number of them are wanting to do it more quickly, uh, simply because there are a number of member states that have a very similar anomaly to what we have here in Northern Ireland. I suppose the, the point to make is that, um, say, the, the directive that we're we remain subject to because we left Europe. We le we took with us, if you like, the implications of the directive as it applied at the time of exit. So we we are uh, potentially vulnerable to the, a very wide interpretation of the directive. So vehicles could extend to ride on lawnmowers, to to buggies, and to the use of those on private land. So. EU are moving away from that. They've moved away from it with this new directive. But because we left before that directive was adopted, and because we took with us the case law that applied at that time, it's it's that reason that's sort of increasing the urgency to work to disapply that case law. So, you know, just a final point, here. I, obviously, because I was trying to imagine a scenario where you know this would take, but you've yeah. mentioned it, private land, and but say in terms of the other jurisdictions, obviously. It impacts them some way, but not the same. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. The, 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 there'll be a similar position in Ireland, but Ireland will be implementing the amended directive. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Chair. Next question from Roy Beggs. Uh, this has been an issue of concern, I think, since I placed questions last February uh, to the Minister. Uh, and. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased that it's uh, finally something's uh, moving forward on, on, on the issue. Um, now, you're, because there's huge cost implication for every vehicle owner in Northern Ireland, £50 a year increase in insurance costs if we do nothing. Um, and there does seem to be clear support for it. But, but my question is, in, in terms of uh, accelerated passage, which is not a good way to introduce legislation, will we be mirroring the legislation which at least has been scrutinised in detail at Westminster has completed its committee stage rather than invent something new which may be problematic? Yeah, so what we're doing is what the, what the PMB in Westminster is really to maintain the status quo, and that's exactly what this pass, accelerated passage bill would be doing so that we would be maintaining the status quo. Uh, and, and 
when someone comes seeking accelerated passage, we're normally given a copy of what the, the draft legislation is, so we know what we're saying yes to. I'm content to say in principle yes, but I, I, I need to see what the legislation is before I can say definitively that I, that I would support it. And I fully respect that. Um, the, the first draft of the bill, I understand, is, is completed, so there will be work ongoing, and of course we'll get a copy to the committee um, at the earliest opportunity. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Andrew Muir. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, in principle, I would support accelerated passage for the circumstances that have been outlined. Um, I would support this legislation goes through, and we have seen the correspondence from different bodies advocating for its passage. Um, to me, this crystallises why we need to be able to see through the end of this mandate. There is important legislation to be passed, um, and also I am very aware that um, whoever is returned in the election in May also need to be getting back into this place and get cracking in relation to all the work that needs to be done. And would the Minister just agree with me that it is important we see through the end of this mandate to ensure that legislation like this is passed? Because if it does not, it has a serious impact upon the citizens of Northern Ireland. I absolutely agree. I mean, we have talked about um, the ramifications if we don't correct this anomaly. But even if you're talking about um, people who pay their insurance, we have a rising cost of living crisis, and the last thing people need is their insurance premiums on top of that increasing. Um, this is only one of a number of issues that we're seeking to resolve from the Department of Infrastructure's pr perspective, but members will know there's critical legislation across a number of government departments also coming forward from private members as well. So it is crucial that we utilise every minute and every second of the remaining mandate to improve the lives of our citizens and that we hit the ground running in the return of the new mandate so that we can continue on. Uh, work that's being progressed, but also have a comprehensive um, suite of legislation that we intend to bring forward um, in the new mandate, again, to improve our public services, but also to improve uh, the lives of all of our citizens who live here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have no other members indicating for a question on this particular topic. Obviously, the committee has heard uh, from departmental officials and, indeed, the minister, and will consider an appropriate response. Uh, following today's committee. We we'll now move on to our, our next briefing session, which is January, January monitoring round and indeed also uh, the wider budget. I understand the Minister's briefing may incorporate more than that, but for members questioning, we will stick very much to those particulars to begin with. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to provide you with a short update on the January monitoring round and the work currently being progressed by my department. The arrival of the extremely virulent Omicron variant just before Christmas has reminded us all, if indeed we needed reminding, that COVID is still with us, though hopefully we are finally emerging from it. My officials are monitoring closely the impact of the Omicron surge on staff absence levels, and in particular where these may impact on the delivery of our frontline services. I am well aware that the effects of Omicron are not just being faced by the public sector and that there are particular challenges for parts of the bus and coach sector that have been particularly reliant on tourism. I have listened to the sector and examined the evidence provided by them, and I am of the view that there is clear evidence that some businesses have still been experiencing losses. However, as the committee will be aware, any financial assistance can only be provided by my department if exceptional circumstances exist to justify the use of the Financial Assistance NI Act 2009. I have written to the First and Deputy First Ministers setting out the rationale for the exceptional circumstances, seeking their approval to grant me the necessary powers to stand up the scheme and to the wider executive on the necessary funding required for such a scheme. And I would hope to have this on the agenda at our next executive meeting tomorrow. As well as dealing with the impact of the current wave, my officials are also continuing to address the impact of previous emergency periods. In the eight months since driving tests resumed, the DVA has conducted 46,525 driving tests, which is 39 per cent higher than the five-year average for that period. This includes a significant number of candidates who have failed their tests and have been unable to book a further test or tests in a relatively short period of time. While we have to manage the immediate, I have always been clear that we must also plan for the future. I want our societal and economic recovery to be based on a greener future that helps to address the impacts of climate change. It is vital that we build on COP26 to ensure a step change in how we work together to tackle this crisis. My department's Blue Green Infrastructure Fund, through the delivery of a wide range of projects, 
continues to transform our communities, promote active travel and people-centred place shaping, supported by a further investment of £20 million in 2021-22. I also recently established a task force to consider electric vehicle infrastructure in the context of prioritising active travel and public transport. This forms part of my wider programme of work to decarbonise transport, as recently outlined in response to the Committee's inquiry into decarbonisation of road transport. However, I cannot discuss my plans for the future without referencing my Department's budget position. It is no secret that my department has struggled since its creation in 2016 with insufficient resource funding to deliver public services to the standards people would like. The past few months, however, have presented even more challenges for us. The unprecedented rise in energy prices affecting households and businesses and presenting such grave impacts for our most vulnerable families have taken their toll on us too. You know already that Northern Ireland Water is the biggest consumer of electricity here and have been briefed on the scale of cost increases it faces. When we set those against the disappointing outcome from the October monitoring round, it was clear that we faced exceptionally serious risks to the delivery of what is perhaps most important of all public services, the supply of drinking water and the treatment of wastewater. I cannot underestimate the concern this has caused for me as Minister, for the Accounting Officer and for the Northern Ireland Water Board. I know the Committee has equally shared and voiced its concerns, and I do thank you for that. While we await the outcome of January monitoring, I can now confirm to the Committee that the Executive has agreed to provide advance funding of £1.8 million and that there is a willingness to ensure that the delivery of water and wastewater services is not put at further risk between now and the end of the financial year. As Committee members will be aware, TransLink has also faced those same financial pressures since 2016. While significant financial assistance was provided to TransLink in the 2021 financial year, it has not been sufficient to deal with the losses being incurred this year. TransLink's board has expressed its concern regarding the financial viability of the organisation in the face of continued under-resourcing. Therefore, the outcomes of January monitoring and the draft budget will be crucially important for our public transport network. All of this sets the context for the draft budget 2022-25, which, as the committee knows, is now out for consultation. On the basis of what is being proposed in the draft budget, which fails to meet even the Department's inescapable pressures, it is inevitable that some very difficult decisions will be required and there will need to be careful scrutiny and realistic consideration of what is achievable and deliverable across all departments, including my own. While we face financial challenges, I remain committed to improving the lives of everyone here, and key to this is an ambitious, long-term vision which requires a better strategic approach to planning and delivery of our infrastructure. Work to establish an infrastructure commission is progressing, and I look forward to working in a positive partnership across the executive uh, to ensure this COVID recovery commitment is delivered. The public consultation on the All Island Strategic Rail Review, which is due to close on the 21st of January, is a unique opportunity to shape the future of connectivity across the island, and I continue to encourage everyone to get involved. I am delighted that work has started to advance in our Water Bridge project. I am working closely with Louth County Council and others to ensure that my department plays its part in ensuring that it moves from concept to reality as quickly as possible. In addition to crucial infrastructure delivery projects, I continue to have a strong focus on the continuous improvement of our policy delivery. My officials are considering the responses to the recent consultation on the new road safety strategy, and it is my intention to publish the final strategy in the spring. I also want to reiterate my commitment to the A5 project and offer my deepest condolences to the families of the three young men who tragically lost their lives on the road just after Christmas, and my deepest sympathies to all of the families who have lost a loved one on this road. The A5 project is key to improving road safety, and it is also of significant strategic importance to the West. Officials are working hard to complete a new environmental state, state, statement addendum for public consultation so that the public inquiry as planned can be reconvened later this year. The programme timeframe for scheme completion by 2028 remains achievable, and support from the local community for the safety improvements this scheme can bring is welcome, 
and remains so very important. As you know, I'm also looking into the potential for biennial MOT testing of some vehicle categories. Once the analysis of the responses to the call for evidence is complete, I will set out our direction of travel and will of course ensure that the committee is briefed accordingly. Any decision to introduce biennial testing will require primary legislation, which will not be deliverable within the current Assembly mandate, but I believe exploratory work should be taken forward until then. I hope that members have found this update helpful and informative. After two years in post, faced with a pandemic, the crisis of Brexit and climate change, I want to recognise the work of my team, who have remained determined and focused throughout to deliver our critical public services to improve lives. I know the committee recognises the 24-7 nature of this operational department and the scale of these challenges and hopefully will join with me in looking forward to the next four months of this mandate in both rising to these challenges but also seizing the very real opportunities that we have for change. Uh, Katrina, Jeremy, Susan and I are happy to take any questions that the committee may have. Okay. Thank you, Minister. And again, to members, I know Liz joined us late, but we're focusing purely on this session on the January and indeed the budget in general. So I will focus, first of all, to begin with on the January monitoring round, because <clears throat> this is something that the committee has given a lot of consideration to on a number of key themes, particularly on NI Water, TransLink, COVID uh, funding in relation to COVID pressures and indeed uh, those industries that are still facing difficulties. So firstly, to begin with, in Northern Ireland water. And I suppose probably this is an issue that I just don't get, to be honest, Minister, because in the October monitoring round, the Department made a bid for $19.7 million of resource funding in respect of NI water. It received an allocation of $1.5 million leaving a shortfall of $18.2 million. At the time, the Department informed the Committee, and that was a quite a detailed session with the Committee, where we had officials from your Department telling us that the water was going to be turned off in schools and in hospitals if they did not receive the funding that they needed for NI Water. The Minister for Finance had said at the time, if I was right, that um, he would look sympathetically on this issue at January monitoring round. And indeed, this committee took the step to write to the Finance Minister uh, in, in recognition of the huge concerns, particularly with schools and hospitals, regarding this funding. $29.8 million, we were told, was needed. And here in the January monitoring round, we have a bid of $12 million. Now, can you explain that to me, Minister? Is this a game of bluff? Because I don't believe that this committee should be involved in that game of bluff. In fact, I feel quite aggrieved by it because there was quite a considerable discussion by the committee whenever we heard that presentation from officials. And to see now a bid of £12 million, what's going on? Um, Chair, I have to say, um, one thing that this department does, it, it absolutely scrutinises finance. Um, it doesn't play games in terms of making bid to departments. Um, we can stand over every bid that we make. What happened in respect of Northern Ireland Water is that the situation was so critical that we internally reallocated money from my department. So I forewent doing other things to ensure that we could get money to Northern Ireland Water from within the DFI budget uh, from other places because it was so critical. Northern Ireland Water also uh, moved money where it could to try to um, ease the financial burden there. And then we got the 1.8 million allocation. So serious was the situation that we got the 1.8 million allocation in advance of January monitoring. So that will explain the differences in um, the figures in terms of October and January. Also, we're continually reassessing the uh, energy prices impact because it is so volatile. So we're constantly scrutinising that and making sure that any of the bids that we're submitting to the finance minister and the wider executive uh, reflects most up-to-date uh, volatility in terms of the prices. But I'm happy to bring Susan or um, Katrina in if they need to provide any further information. I just try to add to what the, the Minister has said. I don't think we have ever been as concerned. I mean, we spend a lot of time in the Department um, watching every penny because our resource budget situation is perpetually difficult. Um, 
But in this case, um, the Minister, myself, the team and the NI Water Board were all exceptionally concerned at the potential that NI Water could run out of money. Mm. Um, we moved heaven and earth to make sure that NI Water was delivering every penny of efficiency that it could, looking to make savings in areas that in a normal circumstance you probably would consider you know, not areas to, to look for savings. We were doing exactly the same thing. Um, we, we knew we could get to after Christmas. Um, the exceptional decision of the executive to provide some further funding to take us to January monitoring has done that, and we, we await a, and hopefully a positive outcome um, from January monitoring. Uh, but I you can only add to the, the minister's comments. I don't think we've ever been as, as concerned about the um, potential for disruption as we were following the October monitoring round. But you, you can sense the committee's dismay at being told such a serious situation, £29.8 million needed. They see a bit of £12 million. It, it, it didn't stack up. And, and, and all I'm saying is that if it is in the situation we would expect, particularly with the spiralling energy costs and NI Water being at the forefront of those costs that we would have expected to see a bigger bid, I think that's something that, as, as a committee member, I, I find disturbing about looking at how, how these bids ha have come about. I can only say, Chair, and I know you have NI Water coming in a couple of weeks, and I have no doubt that they will speak for themselves. Um, the other factor to bear in mind, and Susan might want to say a wee bit more about this, is that even in that period, the um, energy prices have been fluctuating as well, um, and have been fluctuating over the last couple of weeks in a slightly more downward direction, Susan? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And just to clarify, the NI Water energy bid was £18.2 million after um, October monitoring. Yeah. And then, as Minister's already outlined, um, internally we reallocated 2.7, and NI Water um, identified 1.6 million of savings, and then the additional 1.8. So we can sort of see how it's worked down to 12 million, and remains extremely volatile still. Um, we're in close contact with colleagues in NI Water um, to be alert to any changes um, and to see what hedging arrangements as well can be put in place. So. That's just how it's worked down from that 18 figure down to 12. Okay, and I'm sure other members will touch particularly on NI Water. Moving on to TransLink, and I, I see a more consistent theme here actually 24 million in October monitoring round, and indeed 24 in the January monitoring round, if I'm reading right. Um, I would just like to draw your attention to the correspondence to the committee after we raise concerns with the Finance Minister, and particularly when he talks about. TransLink has received unprecedented financial support from the executive over the past two years, and it is simply not sustainable for this to continue indefinitely. Steps must be taken by the Department for Infrastructure and TransLink to put its finances on a more sustainable footing. Um, could maybe the Minister elaborate on what is the plan for a more sustainable footing, given the challenges that TransLink are facing? Again, another organisation that we heard at the committee from officials that if they did not receive the funding all allocation in January, essentially could potentially go out of, out of business? Well, I mean, I, I can't comment on the rationale of the Finance Minister seeking cuts to our public transport network. Um, but what I can advise is that during the COVID pandemic, TransLink has delivered £20 million of efficiency savings uh, because it is important that we are being as, as efficient as possible. We did um, receive significant amounts of financial assistance, as I said in my opening remarks, for a public transport network. But when that compares to England, Scotland, Wales and the Republic of Ireland, it actually uh, equates to less funding compared to those other parts. Um, but I think the challenge here is that um, TransLink has, uh, it's been well documented, ha has had to eat into its reserves um, because of significant underfunding year on year, which left it uh, in a precarious financial uh, position as it was going into the pandemic. Also, a result of the pandemic, passenger numbers are down, um, and so income is significantly down also. But we also are in the midst of a climate crisis, and I'm very mindful of the committee's report, and I'm very mindful also of the calls from, from committee members and from all parties that um, expanding our public transport network um, is key to tackling the climate emergency. That will require investment, and so we will have um, we can continue on to maintain what we have, 
uh, and we can deliver greater efficiencies by operating only the more profitable routes, which would mean that our rural communities would suffer, which is something as a minister that I would never be able to stand over uh, and would never agree to. Uh, so I suppose for me, the conversation is, are we making sure that TransLink uh, is, is running as efficient service as it can, while also ensuring that we are providing services um, that are not profitable, but are um, beneficial in terms of social justice and connecting <coughs> to our rural communities? And then the fundamental question is, are we going to invest in our public transport network? Uh, and certainly on the capital side, I think the committee will recognise that I've significantly been investing in the decarbonisation uh, of our public transport network. But of course, the difficulty here is always the resource side. And when we have a publicly owned transport network, um, funding and executive funding will always be uh, a challenge. But for me, there are climate action benefits to it, there are economic benefits, um, but there's also a social justice benefit and there's a regional um, balance um, element to it too, to ensure that we have a sound and strong public transport network connecting our rural communities uh, and right through to uh, opportunities for employment right across the north. Okay, and finally from me, Minister, in relation to the other aspect of January monitoring round, which was COVID bid, uh, and I, I have touched quite substantially on the TransLink element of that COVID um, allocation and in your opening pitch in relation to those industries that the COVID recovery lag is certainly going to be apparent. TransLink, I have no doubt in what you have said about passenger numbers, but another industry in which you mentioned at the beginning that I was disappointed I did not see a bid for, and that is the uh, bus and coach operators uh, funding support package, because there is no doubt that if ever there was an industry that is going to face the lag, it is that industry, and they are crying out for support. I have met with them. I met with them on Christmas week. I subsequently to that put a request into your ministerial office for a quick meeting to discuss where th this situation was, because I was quite aware that there was operators that were under such financial stress that potentially they faced the prospect of not only laying off employees, but going under themselves. And in the mouth of Christmas, that is certainly a very, very worrying experience for anybody to be in. I received, I received no response on that. Now, subsequently, I have heard what the Minister has said today, and I welcome that that is going to go to the Executive for approval. But we have seen, uh, in terms of COVID handback, uh, 0.3 million in relation to the previous scheme, and 0.1 million, I think it was for the taxi scheme. You know, I think the sector will look at those handbacks, and that may be for very good reasons in terms of its uh, accountancy aspect. Yes. That, may, that may well be. But the con continual delay and the, and the rationale for justification of whether or not there's an issue there, I think it, it's added insult to injury to that, or to that sector that have, at their own cost, have continually have to, had to come back to department officials and indeed politicians to justify why their industry is literally drowning because of the COVID situation and the lack of recovery in that sector. So I would like the Minister's um, assurance, I think she has given that in the initial session, that this is an industry that will not be allowed to drift any further, because if we drift any further, we essentially see people that their livelihoods, their, their lifelong businesses, family businesses, out of are, are, are literally on the breadline now, in fact, and I think the Minister really does need to deal with this issue, and I hope the Executive support her in dealing with it Thursday, you mentioned, or is it the following week? Well, I have submitted an Executive paper. Obviously, it is up to the First and Deputy First Minister to determine what the, the agenda paper. is. Yeah. Okay. But I just want to assure you, I have provided two previous schemes for the bus and coach sector. I have also engaged with the sector and listened to them, uh, and have written them out, out, out to them on multiple occasions to ask for them to provide as much evidence as possible to enable me to provide the case for exceptional circumstances. I know if you have engaged with the sector that you will know that those that are greatest impacted are those who are the backbone of the tourism industry. And I think there had been a hope there that, given that they were referenced in the Department for Economy Tourism Recovery Strategy, that um, there may have been support provided, uh, given the impact that they have on hospitality in the tourism sector. That has not proven to transpire, and that is why I am now stepping up to bring forward a third scheme. In terms of the bid, it was not possible to submit a financial bid when we were making our returns for January monitoring. But what I did insist on is in the narrative that I provided to the Finance Minister that I made it clear that I was undertaking this piece of work and that we were gathering the evidence. And I would 
we hope to be in the position to come back to make a bid. That's exactly what I've done. That's why I've written to the First and Deputy First Minister seeking powers under the Financial Assistance Act. I've also flagged up to executive colleagues that I will have to have uh, a, an allocation because I don't have the money within my department for a financial scheme. And so I'm determined to provide support to the industry. The same way that um, there was two schemes for the taxi sector, but recognising that they were also struggling in terms of the level of demand and shortage of drivers. In, that, in light of that feedback, I have brought forward the, the scheme where we are waiving the fee for tests for new taxi drivers, uh, installing free meters, uh, and also um, introducing a fare increase because the taxi industry was telling us and the drivers that they were struggling with fuel costs. Mm -hmm. But I also recognise that they wanted us to look at it in a more comprehensive fashion, which is why, in addition to the 7.6 per cent fare increase, which I drove forward to ensure would be in place by December, which is one of their busiest periods, that I also committed to a more comprehensive fair review, uh, which we will carry out in the spring. I, uh, and in closing on, on, this, on this particular issue, I think there has to be the recognition that continually going back to that sector to request further justification is adding further cost to businesses that are already struggling. That, that is the case. They have made that very clearly to, to me, as the Department has continually requested for further justification to make the Department's case for more funding, essentially, is, is how I see that. But, Chair, but you will appreciate that we do require accounting evidence because it is public money. So what we have tried to do is to have a scheme that does not labour. Um, and put a huge burden on the industry. But as you will know from your engagement, it is a very diverse sector. There are operators of all <coughs> sizes. Uh, and so for me, it's very important that we have that evidence that can demonstrate the extent of their losses, mm -hmm. which enables us then to be able to provide robust financial uh, support to them. But obviously, all of these schemes will come under scrutiny from the Auditor General. And we're very mindful too in terms of managing public money. So it's about making sure that you protect the public purse, yes. but that you have that evidence so that you can get the support to the sector and protect to those who are suffering substantial losses. There are operators of all sides, but there is no doubt that every single one of them are facing losses. And I, and think, for, and I think for them, saying 300,000 hand back on the previous scheme, for them, whilst the Department is asking <coughs> for further information where they have to get that information from accountants, etc., again, is adding insult to injury. And I think it's an issue that has long since passed the time for action. And I respect and I, I say the Minister has requested for that to go under the agenda paper. And I hope we can see results thereof. Yeah, and just, just to draw my comments to a close, what I would say is, you know, um, I wanted to make sure that we maximised the allocation and got it to support in sectors. Mm -hmm. But um, I think compared to other government departments in terms of handbacks of COVID funding schemes, I think my department uh, was very efficient and effective in, in the use of it. And we will continue to choose that we can get maximum support to sectors uh, th to help them through this very difficult and period. And I appreciate that. And this committee is here to scrutinise the budget for the Department for Infrastructure. So I will now go to David Hillich for a question, followed by Liz Kimmins and Patrick Thanks, Chair. Uh, very welcome, Minister, and your, and your team here today. Uh, you, you mentioned there that you, you had to basically look under the settee, down the back of the settee, to see if any money was available to help out them due to the circumstances of the monitoring rounds. Where, where, where did you find that money? What was, what was laid to the side, and, and how much was that? Yep. So uh, maybe hand to Susan or, or yep. Katrina for the detail of that 2.7. Yep. So in total, we um, were able to identify 2.7 million of reduced requirements. So these were primarily things that we actually couldn't spend this financial year um, due to a range of circumstances um, across the entire department, um, not within our ALDs, purely just within the department itself. And what the figure was? It was 2.7 million in total for the department. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure whether the microphone's not working or not. I can't really hear that oh, well. Sorry. Either. Very quiet. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try it a bit louder. 2.7. No <laughs> Is that better? Okay, thank you. And also on the uh, circumstances regarding assistance for the coach and bus industry, there, y you have put forward some ideas about that in relation to what could be deemed to be exceptional circumstances. Are you able to share what those exceptional circumstances are with the committee? Or? Yeah, um, so the, the previous scheme was around the demonstration of 40% loss of income. Uh, the proposal for this scheme, and, I, and I, I obviously want to respect the confidentiality of the executive, so I've yet to get agreement on all of this, but it would be around standing up a similar scheme that would have had the flexibilities that we brought forward listening to the feedback from the, um, the sector on the previous scheme. So if you remember, we removed the £100,000 cap, for instance. Um, we, the sector had fed back about the importance of having a clear communications plan to assist all of that. So we're trying to bring that all on board. Um, but if we were to craft a brand new 
uh, financial scheme that would take us many months and so I'm very mindful that the sector needs to get support um, at the earliest opportunity. I would also be proposing to run that um, from the closure of the previous scheme up to March 2022. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liz Cummins. Thanks, Chair, and thank the Minister and officials for, for coming in this morning. I think just going back um, to, the, to the NI water bids, and, I, and like the Chair said, I share the concerns just in terms of the stark difference. And I know the Minister has, has given some, some explanation around that. I think, firstly, it's wrong to imply that the Finance Minister has suggest, had asked for cuts. It was more about you know, ensuring ministers are, are using public money to, to, in the best way possible. In particular, around TransLink, I think um, you know, it's about looking at how it's best spent in, in investing in our public transport and, and making it more efficient. So I do think it is wrong to imply that the Minister suggested those cuts. Um, but what I would ask in terms of the, the reallocations for um, between October and, and the January monitoring rounds, where, where, were those re where, where did those reallocations come from and what were the impact of that? And did that cover the shortfall um, you know, in terms of the, the bid made in October and what we're looking at now? And is the £12 million that has been bid for in the, the January monitoring rounds additional to what was, was um, referenced in the October monitoring rounds in terms of the, the £18 million? No, I can maybe bring Susan in. So I think we need to be very clear. So the, the bid in January monitoring um, was, and this is my understanding, that it was £18.2 million pounds for Northern Ireland Water. We then found within the department, uh, because we scrutinised went right across the department to see, because we were so concerned about the situation, and we then um, took £2.7 million from within the departmental budget, and we gave that to Northern Ireland Water. Northern Ireland Water also then found £1.6 million pounds of savings, and the executive then, recognising the severity of the situation, awarded one8 in advance of January monitoring. By my calculation, that brings us down to the figure that we have now submitted for January monitoring. So that explains the difference in the figures from October to January. It's the 2.7, the 1.6, and the 1.8. Yeah. That's grand. I suppose then, leading on from that, um, and in terms of bids put in for the road energy costs, and, and we all are very aware of the, of the rising costs, um, but there was no bid put in for, for additional road works. Um, and obviously, you know, and I've, I've said this repeatedly about my own area in particular, being one of those most affected by the lack of resurfacing. I mean, I, I just I, I thought I think I thought that it might be a, a good a time to to put in a bit ahead of it, so that even smaller works could be completed. So, um, I mean, I would have thought in in the past the department would have had prepared schemes in anticipation of monitoring around funding. So. Um, especially since last year, where there's been no, there were no bids put in either. So, have we not learned any lessons from that, or, or can we explain why there were no bids put in for roadworks? Because there's bound to be a, you know, huge list at this stage, particularly in those areas that have been most affected by the, the resurfacing contract issues. Yeah, so, we have made bids in previous monitoring rounds, um, and you know, not all of them were successful. I think the challenge that we have as a department now is that we're sitting, you know, um, middle of January. Uh, any new capital monies has to be spent by the end of this financial year, and also in addition to that, we have the asphalt contract difficulty, which, you know, has through no fault of our own through legal challenge impacted on our ability to get schemes on the ground. So we are constantly reviewing to see where we can maximise money for, you know, for, for roadworks, and we continue to do that. But I suppose the asphalt situation then, given the very late stage that we're now at, has meant that we have put in a capital bid in January monitoring, I think it's for 3.6 or 3.8 million pounds, and um, that's for the A6. Um, but we will continue to maximise where we can the money going to our roads, because it is a priority for us. I suppose just on the back of that, and, and that's kind of what, I'm, what the question is that I'm asking, is that we've known for months and months and months what the issues are, and surely, you know, in anticipation of the monitoring rounds, knowing that we have a short window to spend it, um, would it not have been, you know, a, 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 a prudent to to put in bids, or, or to have schemes ready, so that if the bids were successful, they could have been completed by the end of the, the financial year? And also, I suppose, would I ask, is there any intention to put in bids before the, you know, further bids before the end of the mandate for that? Because, I mean, even from speaking to to representatives from the industry. Um, they feel that there, are, there is work that could have been done. Mm. Um, and we have asked for, for representatives to come in and brief the committee because certainly what we're hearing on the ground and what we're hearing at um, committee here from officials and from the staff minister is that um, you know, it's two different 
situations, and and certainly we think that even smaller works could have been could have been done um, if if bids have been submitted and, and other work have been done on it. No, look, and I want to assure um, you and the rest of the committee and members of the public that I continually press officials on this particular issue, um, constantly pressing to make sure are we maximising our budget going into our road network, are we doing everything that we can within the capacity of the own, our own department, are we doing everything we can, working with contractors um, to make sure that we're getting roads resurfaced, that we're doing what we can to improve the road network, particularly um, in our rural areas. So certainly I keep pushing on that. You know, hand over to Katrina to yeah. Go into any further detail mm -hmm. about just to, to re-emphasise that, um, and and I know the um, the team would be very happy to, to brief the committee at a later stage if that's helpful. But we have incredibly professional um, engineering teams who will be looking for every opportunity within the public expenditure rules and within the capacity available to them to do the work they they know communities want to see and they want to see as well. So I can absolutely assure the member that every opportunity is taken. Um, we do have a particular issue, and it's a well-documented issue, around the, um, the fact that capital and resource budgets are dealt with on two completely different tracks, and you do need staff capacity um, as well as contractor capacity, but I have absolutely no doubt that those teams and section offices and on the ground look for every opportunity they can, and the minister pushes them and us. Mm -hmm. To, to do so because we know this matters to, to people and communities. Yeah, and just to suppose the final point on that issue is I wouldn't dispute that the section officer because I know from working closely that anything they can do within the mm -hmm. remit they have been doing I know that in my own area. But it just it really concerns me that the, the, the works that like I mean I can list examples like other members could of, of roads that have been waiting a long, long time. Um finally got approval but can't can't be completed due to all the sorts of issues that we've talked about contracting and all of that, but surely there has been there could have been ways of looking, you know, in terms of making bids through maybe the roads recovery fund, things like that, that may have been able to address it. So it's just about trying to, to maximise um, what, what we can work with. My final point just on the bus, bus and coach industry as well, and kind of to re reiterate the points of the chair. Um, obviously we've met with them uh, on numerous occasions and I think Obviously, you've brought uh, Minister new information this morning about what you've um, brought to the executive, and hopefully it will get on the agenda this week. But it still just baffles me why it has taken so long, because mm. we, we've been well aware of the, the, the calls from the sector, the problems they've been having. There has been support in place and, uh, at the beginning, and, um, but a lot of time has passed. And from the, co the letter in our correspondence, um, it's clear that they haven't had much feedback from the department um, or from, the, from yourself as the minister for, for some time. Um, so, and that, well, that's that's what they've said in the letter. So, um, it's just to try and determine why why it has taken so long. And I can understand the sector's um, frustration. I've met with them, and I'm also in regular correspondence with um, sector representatives. Um, there's multiple pieces of correspondence going back. I, I suppose that what I really wanted to make sure. Um, was that we had the most robust and up-to-date evidence of losses from the industry. And that's why, you know, before Christmas, because I was very conscious of the Christmas period, I wrote out again as a last attempt to say, make sure that you have everything that you have to hand to demonstrate the impact on your business, and you've passed that through to the department. Um, I'm now in a position where I can write to set out the exceptional circumstances, and um, I'm very confident that I'll be able to get the full support of the executive to bring forward a third scheme for the sector that will cover the period, as it said to Mr Hilditch, from the uh, end of the, of the second scheme uh, up until uh, March of this year, which is in an extended period much further than the previous two schemes. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Patrick Delargy. Yeah, uh, can you hear me okay, Chair? Yeah. Yep. Um, Minister, I just want to start by echoing the, the comments of my colleague, Luz Kimmons, as well. I mean, we get a briefing on here that was apocalyptic. Um, you know, we had, we had minister, or we had officials, sorry, sent in to, to give us this, this briefing that we needed 29 million. And I mean, the concern, what I don't understand is the discrepancy. You've now bid for 40 per cent of what you told us you needed. But the fact that you said then the money had been found within the department, it would strike me that, firstly, I would like to re-emphasise that that is the role of a minister. That is the role of a department, firstly, to seek out within your own budget 
where you can reallocate money, where you can find those funds, rather than sending officials and running and the committee to tell us that we need the direct finance minister to send more money. To me, it comes across as scaremongering and it comes across as political point scoring. So I just want to put that on the record first. Could I maybe just address that? No, I'm that? going to finish. I note that also in the department has also bid for £3.7 million in capital funding in respect of the flagship ASEC scheme. So I just wonder if you could comment on that. First of all, to address your first point, I do believe there seems to be some confusion in the statistics, and I think we maybe need to take a moment just to be clear. Um, uh, an October monitoring round, um, the department bid for Northern Ireland Water, water Energy for £19.7 million. Mm -hmm. It was allocated £1.5 million in October monitoring, which left a balance of £18.2 million. Subsequently, between October monitoring round outcome and the January monitoring round period, um, as we have discussed, the department internally allocated £2.7 million. Northern Ireland Water found savings of £1.6 million, and the executive, recognising how crucial things were, gave us £1.8 million pound to take us up to the period of the 20th of January, when we would expect to have the January monitoring bid. That then equates with the £12 million of the bid for January monitoring, so there is no discrepancy in those, those figures. Um, the difference in October and January relates to the fact that the £2.7 million 1.6 million and 1.8 million were then allocated to Northern Ireland Water. So that explains the difference in the figures. So I just think it's important that we understand that, unless there's other figures that the committee may have that I am not clear on understanding. But in respect, um, um, sorry, of your second point, which was, sorry, Podrick. The A6, the A6, the A6 yes, sorry, so sorry, the A6 million. is to do with the adjustable claims. So um, there's been an increase in the cost of the A6, um, and the department has been working with the contractors on that. I don't know if Susan or Katrina want to come in on any further detail on that. No, it's just in terms of further detail, we bid for £3.7 million for the A6. Can you hear me OK, Jess? Yeah. yeah. Um, and in addition to that, then we rebadge some of our existing capital of about £28 million um, to address then those rising cost increases within the A6 scheme. So in total, that's around an additional £32 million um, for the, the increases then that we hadn't forecast at the start of the year. Is that primarily to do with materials then? Or? So it's a range of factors, yep. It's primarily to do with the increased cost of materials as well as then the COVID impact too. So it's, those are the two, two key factors. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Muir. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of things. First of all, in relation to roads maintenance, um, key duty we're here to is to represent the people, and it's obviously a key issue that contact, people contact myself and my colleagues in relation to roads maintenance and the, up to, the repair of our roads. They're really, in many instances, not in a great state. There's real frustration there because my understanding from the latest um, answers from the Finance Minister is that there's capital funding which is unallocated, so there's a real risk that we're going to be handing back capital funding at the end of this financial year because we haven't had the ability to spend it. And to me, there seems to be a systemic problem in terms of the ability for the department to be able to get these roads maintenance projects delivered on the ground. I'm going to get some comment maybe from the minister, from officials, really about what's more being done to try to reform internally within the department to ensure that we can spend this money. The money is there; we just need to be able to spend it. Uh, and I've got two other questions, really, in relation to Northern Ireland Water and Transit. But maybe, if it's okay, take the roads maintenance one because the other ones are slightly separate. Yeah. yeah um, so, in, in respect of kind of our, our roads, um, Andrew, you'll know that um, in terms of the Rural Roads Fund, that I increased that to fifteen million pounds this financial year, which is a fifty percent increase on the previous year, and that's the highest level of funding to date that's been allocated to a specific rural roads initiative, and um, that's not impacted by the asphalt. Um, but the truth is that the the impact of the um, legal challenges in that regard has had an impact on the ability of the department to get contracts out. Um, we have work on phase one, um, which we're hoping to award contracts in March, and that covers a significant number of the areas impacted by the legal challenge and works ongoing on phase two. And I suppose that comes to the point you're asking about what are you doing to make sure that you can maximise capital monies and get it onto your roads. That's why officials have been working to develop uh, a new interim procurement strategy, which um, is around um, different phases, but also supplementing that by one-off contracts, so that there are many more contracts going out to different contractors to enable us to maximise the work 
um, on the ground, and it is only right that we continue to challenge ourselves on that. While it has been hugely frustrating in terms of the impact of, of legal challenges, um, we should be always, as a department, scrutinising how we are doing business to make sure that we are maximising um, the amount of investment that we can, particularly on the capital side. But I would come back to the point that uh, the Permanent Secretary made about um, you know, you do need resource funding to be able to staff um, and get this work done. So I think it's very important that we don't um, fall into the trap of decoupling um, capital from from a resource side. No problem. Uh, just in relation to Translink and Northern Ireland Water, at the outside I want to make it clear that these are key services delivered by key workers, and uh, we're all very grateful for that. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that that's the criticality of that. Uh, I'm very concerned about the future of Translink in relation to the statements back from the Finance Minister um, and the continued impact upon COVID-19 upon the, uh, the Translink. I just want to see some comment from yourself that if the situation continues to pertain as in terms of no allocations for monitoring rounds, what impact will that have to the day-to-day -day lives of people across Northern Ireland? And that's really concerning for me in the context of COP26 and the commitments we're given around that. In relation to Northern Ireland Water, I met Northern Ireland Water. I went through the details in relation to why they were facing these cost pressures, and I got across the detail in relation to this. Uh, I think it is really critical that Northern Ireland Water are given funding to be able to deal with the energy costs that have hit them. Let us be clear, Northern Ireland Water are the highest user of electricity in Northern Ireland. So this is why they have been hit with these costs, and it is important that the monitoring round allows them to give them some certainty in terms of delivery of services. And, you know, the money was taken from internally within Northern Ireland Water and within DFI to be able to continue service delivery. The issue for me is that we can't have this on an ongoing basis because these energy costs are an ongoing issue. And as whether consideration is being given to the governance model within Northern Ireland Water, because some of this issue is arising because of the way it's structured, that they've been able to actually give price certainty in relation to how it delivers its services. So it's really I have to acknowledge that there is, these figures are not made up. These are real figures that have been presented to the committee. I've got across the detail in relation to it. It's important that we actually focus on the issues and give certainty to public transport provision and also Northern Ireland Water. And as part of Northern Ireland Water, I think we do need to look at the governance model because what we have at the moment is we have Northern Ireland Water uh, hanging by monitoring rounds, and that is not good for the delivery of water and wastewater services in Northern Ireland. Thank you, um, Andrew, and to thank you and other committee members as well for, you know, on a consistent basis, putting on record your appreciation for the frontline workers in the department in TransLink and Northern Ireland Water, because they have worked tirelessly throughout the pandemic, uh, providing critical services. So I want to thank you, Andrew, uh, and others, you know, for acknowledging that, because I know it does lift the morale of those working on the front line. In terms of the risks to our public transport network, I mean, it's significant. We have a public transport network that could serve particularly our rural communities much better. We have insufficient levels of rail connectivity, um, particularly I'm thinking of the North West. And so all of that requires investment. And, and I've said in response to the Chair, you know, there's a climate change issue here, there is an economic and societal issue. There's also a social justice issue in ensuring that people have access to public transport. Um, and so, while we're battling at the moment to maintain existing services, you know, I would be hopeful that as we move into the three-year budget, that there is recognition of the importance of a publicly owned public transport network and the multiple benefits that that uh, delivers, and that we will have sufficient funding to maintain what we have, but also to expand to expand the network on both the bus. Um, and the rail side um, as well. In saying that, the committee will know because the, the three-year budget is out for consultation. It falls short of meeting the department's inescapable pressures, both on the resource um, and the capital side. And so that will require very difficult decisions for the um, new infrastructure minister, whoever he or she um, may be. Um, on the issue of the, the structure of Northern Ireland water, the challenge here, Andrew, is you what model do you have if you're opposed to the introduction of water charges? Uh, that's my position and the SDLP's position. I'm the current minister, uh, and I don't sense an appetite within the uh, executive um, to find a consensus on change in the funding model um, because there are concerns that it will lead to the introduction of water charges. And so different parties will have their own view on that. But again, what I would hope is that moving into the three-year budget, you will have that certainty in terms of Northern Ireland Water uh, and its ability to plan its capital projects, but also you know, know what it's got in its budget for the next three years so that it's not living 
to a hand and mouth, if you like. And I granted, this period has been particularly difficult because we have had this significant and unprecedented rise in our energy prices. Yeah. Just in conclusion, Chair, I was at a presentation on Monday of the work Northern Ireland Water doing to expand the sort of energy supply in terms of hydrogen and yeah. hydro. And I think it's important that that investment is made to give certainty in terms of price costs so that it be commended. We're looking at that in terms of both the short, medium and long term, because I think that is crucial. And it's also crucial for Northern Ireland really in terms of consumers, because people are these price shocks are making situations where people have to make a decision about whether heat or eat, and that is not right. And we need to be able to provide solutions for that. Yeah, I agree with that and I think we, we tend to focus in on you know, maintaining the Northern Ireland water in terms of its critical service, um, maintaining our public transport network. But actually, when you look at what Northern Ireland Water and TransLink are actually doing on the whole climate action agenda, it is it's really impressive, and they have huge ambitions to do more. And so, you know, it's not just a matter for the Department for Infrastructure. I'm very mindful of the Executive's Green Growth Strategy um, as well. So, certainly, those two arms length bodies have a huge role to play in terms of um, alternative energy and just driving forward that whole climate action agenda. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Cara Hunter. Joining us via Zoom. Yes, George, you'll be brought in. That's <laughs> your turn. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and I'd like to thank uh, both the Minister uh, and the panel for being here today. And I have to say, um, I'm extremely disappointed and baffled um, at the politicking that I've seen here this morning. And I think uh, I'll be focusing my questions uh, surrounding the rollout of our public services, because I think that's what uh, is the most absolute priority here. Um, but essentially, I'd also like to add a comment just around the coach industry. And I'd like to thank uh, the department officials that met with representatives within my own constituency in late December as the meeting with engaging and extremely helpful for the sector and certainly myself to hear more about uh, schemes. So thank you. And I'd like to also thank the department and the minister for continuing to be consistent and constant in bringing forward uh, written briefings surrounding uh, need and financial assistance uh, throughout the past year. But I'll just go on to my questions now. Uh, minister, uh, you know, uh, late in December uh, last year, we heard evidence surrounding concerns and pressures facing both NI Water and TransLink. Um, and we had written to the finance minister uh, just to highlight and reiterate those concerns. Um, so can I just ask, if your bids are met within the January, January monitoring, are you confident you will get that support into the next month um, to year budgetary period? Yep, uh, thank you, Kerry. I mean, I, I've made the case extensively um, at the executive. Um, and to be fair to the executive, it absolutely recognises recognise the critical situation within Northern Ireland Water. That's why it took the unprecedented step of giving an allocation of 1.8 million outside of the January monitoring period. Um, so that is recognised. And there was a recognition that we needed to act urgently. And if we need to act urgently, then the urgency of ensuring that there is sufficient funding for Northern Ireland Water to meet its inescapable energy costs at the end of this financial year. I think that the argument has been won on that. So I would be very hopeful that in terms of the bids that I've submitted in the January monitoring, you know, that it will garner the support of, uh, of all of the executive. Uh, and hopefully we will see you know, allocations across to enable those critical public services to continue. Thank you. And then, Minister, just a, a question focused more locally. It would be around um, recently there was a Belfast Council had a motion brought forward surrounding um, providing a free public transport public transport for young people. Um, I think it's a great idea, but just given the, the recent pressures within your department, um, I would hope all ministers and partners uh, would support you in this. Um, can you outline your consideration of this motion? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, no, I, sorry, I, Minister. Just if we could come back to that one, just after the general monitoring running budget, I'll appreciate, Carrie. I want to focus just on this budgetary. The you minister, can, the minister can come back to that point on the end. Do you have another question in relation to the general monitoring running budget? No, nope, I'm currently content. Okay. Thank you. Right, we will come back to that one with the minister. Um, on to Cahill Boylan, please. Thank you, Chair. Just two quick points. I mean, and I appreciate, Minister. You, you know, this committee supported most of the bids that you put in. But I, I want to go back to the NIW issue because there was a pain, the picture painted here the day we received the brief, briefing that you know NIW was on a drip and wasn't because it was stated that the water we are getting close to the water being torn off. Now, you know, I would say legally that would not be correct. You know, I, I would stand correct in that matter, whether legally or not they would be able to do that. There, there may be court cases out there, but, but in terms of ordinary people being denied access to water, I do not think that would be correct. But, but the point is, and I appreciate it, 
you've, you've given an explanation there for figures. So all of a sudden, whatever number of weeks ago, the water was about to be torn off, and all of a sudden now we found the money. There's a dispute around what figures is correct and not correct. All of a sudden we found the money between the departmental officials, between NAW savings and everything else. But the truth of the matter is, when that presentation was made here, there was a bleak picture painted by NIW. And we've just gone through the PC20 and PC21 process. So this committee has supported most of those bids. So what I would say to the Minister is, in making presentations and in having conversations in the future with NIW, was you or I would not like to see anybody's water torn off, especially given what we've gone through the last two years. They need to be presenting the arguments correctly, because it, it doesn't add up what, what's happened over between what the bid in October, what's coming through in, in January, because it, it's not painting the right picture right across the board. So when you have the conversations, because the, the person who sat there and made the presentation said things that bad, the water could be torn off. That's what they did say on the day. Uh, and Cahill, see, when I was advised of the very difficult situation, I pressed and went back on my officials to say that I needed to be very clear on Northern, from Northern Ireland Water about the extent of this, the seriousness of this situation. And it came back to say that it was, this was critical. And it was so critical that and the bid that we made in January was £18.2 million. But, no. or, sorry, October was £18.2 yeah. million. Pounds. Between that period and, and today, £6.1 million pounds has been allocated to Northern Ireland Water, £2.7 million from within my department, £1.6 million from within Northern Ireland Water, and one point eight. That was the figure that was required to get us to the 20th of January. So we, we, have saved, we have staved off the crisis until the 20th of January, and we have now the bid in for £12 million, which equates to all of that for January Monitor. Now I'm hoping um, that the executive will agree to that. I, I'm, I'm confident, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I'm confident that they will, because they recognise the severe, se severity of it. So if that £12 million is allocated, that deals with the inescapable financial pressures until the end of the financial year, dependent on the volatility and the continued volatility of the um, energy prices. So factually, um, that is the case. And I want to assure you that I have no interest in playing games around bids. Uh, don't run to the media saying, well, this isn't crisis and this is, this is not. I push back all the time to say, let me see the evidence of this. Let me see the detail. And I was given very clear advice about how critical this situation was. That's why I wrote on multiple occasions to my executive colleagues saying, I need to bring you up to speed on how serious the situation is. And the executive recognised that. And that's why it stepped out of the confines of the January monitoring round to ensure that we were able to get money across to bring Northern Ireland Water up to just the 20th of January when we would have the normal January monitoring procedure. And I appreciate that, Minister, but when we were here, we were a scrutiny committee, we discussed this, we asked the officials where the savings was coming, because at the end of the day, like yourself, you have to manage your own budgets. They have to manage their own budgets. But the paint, picture painted that day because me and Mr. Beggs had a good ding dong over it about water being switched switched off, which is wrong, to totally, totally wrong. That impression created that day was totally, totally wrong. Cahill, so, uh, yeah, 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 sorry, on, Chair, a factual, on a factual point yes. for, for, for yeah, the information idea, yeah. of the committee, and so just to clarify, what was the October monitoring round bid for NI Water? NI Water Energy bid for October monitoring was 19.7. Yeah, 19.7. It was allocated in October monitoring yeah. 1.5, which brought the balance down to 18.2. Okay. So, so just on Cahill's point about factual, the committee received a letter from the Minister on the 5th of November, and it stated, the impact on NI Water, which is the biggest consumer of electricity here, is particularly significant. For NI Water, the increase in inescapable energy costs since September is £29.8 million. To put this in context, and this is directly from your letter, that represents 22 per cent of NI's entire resource budget for the full financial year. With fewer than five months of the remain year remaining, it is clear that this level of cost increase cannot be absorbed without serious consequences and major impacts. The greatest impact is most likely to be seen in wastewater treatment, particularly possible uh, pollution and environmental impacts. While the Department and NI Water will take every step to protect drinking water provision, loss of service cannot be ruled out, for example, in supply restriction, interruptions and possibly drinking water quality at the tap. So, on the numbers, we still have a significant shortfall on the numbers okay. that were presented. Okay, well, I'll bring officials in just to clarify on numbers, and then I think it's very important that we bottom out here that I was given solid advice 
from my officials and from Northern Ireland Water, and it's very important to me that everyone understands yeah. that we're giving solid advice to this committee because that would That's be a we're... very concerning oh. situation. So I think it's really important that we clarify that. Yeah. Uh, and just to, to pick up on the Minister's point, Chair, and, and in response, in response to, to Cahill's points, um, I, mean, I personally spent quite a bit of time with the NI Water Board. I have um, no doubts as to how serious potentially this was. You're talking about a publicly funded organisation, but also um, a company limited by guarantee where the board have specific duties. There are issues around um, whether or not you can trade when you don't have the, the financial cover. Um, we spent many hours working through how serious this was. Um, we spent many hours looking at the scenarios. We were trying to get through Christmas and then with the extra um, allocation through to January monitoring with the sole focus of putting every ounce of energy that we had into making sure that we could avoid disruption. The risk of disruption was first and foremost to wastewater because um, NI Water and we were clear that every single thing we could do would be done to um, protect drinking water, but the risks of something going wrong and the funding not being there um, to, to fix it <coughs> were what gave grounds um, for concern about drinking water, but the primary concern was around wastewater and wastewater treatment. I can say to you that um, we did spend very significant time with the, with the board and the senior team in NI Water, and I um, was so concerned, uh, as were my, my colleagues in the executive office, that we were looking actually at the um, civil contingency structures so that in the event that something did happen, we would have the best possible means of, of responding to it. But those were the, that was the situation we faced. And there was certainly um, nothing other than the facts and the assessment of the NI Water team and the NI Water board um, that was driving us. And certainly that was the basis on our advice to the Minister. Cahill, you want to continue on? Yeah, yeah just, uh, I, I'm all right, Chair. We, we've had a discussion of it. I mean, the point is, Katrina, you know, every household over the last two years has been doing the same, managing their budgets and looking over their shoulders and asking government for support. So all I'm saying to you, it's a company there that should have been watching it for their own budgets, and I appreciate we've all been hit by pressures. But on that day when the presentation was made here, you know, it was as if they were, running, they were going to operate on the drip and they were going to switch water off, which was totally, totally wrong, because I don't think legally they can, but I'll stand correct on that matter anyway, in, in individual rights. Um, and, and that's the point I'm trying to make, and I want to emphasise that, because when we hear these figures, and so our job to scrutinise them. But equally, so, there is no scenario in which we would be providing advice to the Minister or advice to this committee um, that wasn't based no, on no, the I appreciate it, assessment. But, but why I'm bringing the issue up is that when the conversations rise again in NIW, there's no point coming in this committee to say, unless there's a catastrophic issue, that the, they're switching the water off. That's the point I want to make. The other point I want to make also, and, and to be fair to the Minister, um, and to follow on from Liz's point about the genuine monitoring around on the roads issues, because for a number of years, especially living in a rural area, there's not a corner you're torn if in the month of January, from January to March, any year that there wasn't road wars going on. That isn't happening now, because we were always able to shovel ready projects was there. And, you know, Minister, and uh, I know I've been engaged with the industry, Liz and many other members have been engaged with the industry. Was there not a way with engaging with contractors out there to facilitate some of those emergency works that could have been, or well, not so much emergency, but, yeah. but works, smaller works that could have been carried out under contracts or rangers? Because that's what does happen. We supported monitoring rounds in January for those works we carried out that period up to the end of the finance of the year. And I would make that point in terms of the monitoring. But just you, to assure you on the emergency, you'll know, Cahill, that any emergency works are carried out as part of um, like our response to maintenance, so that, that work is carried out. There's also the Rural Roads Fund, and as I, I said in response to Mr Muir's question, um, we've got the highest level of funding yet allocated specific to a Rural Roads Fund, um, so that is our, and it's specifically targeted mm -hmm. at, at our rural roads. Um, um, and it's a 50% increase on last year. I suppose the challenge um, across the north has been the, the asphalt situation and the legal challenges, which are out with the department's control. But in saying that, in responding to it, the department has been working at pace on the interim procurement 
um, strategy, um, awarding you know, uh, contracts and phases to make sure that those areas um, are covered. So officials are working very hard on that. And where we can, we're having um, schemes on the ground because it is very important. But certainly, that legal challenge has been a source of great frustration to me. Okay, Roy Beggs. Can I put on record my thanks to the officials who briefed us about Northern Ireland Water uh, in December? Because actually, what they said, it seems to me, has actually turned out to be very factually correct. That there had to be an emergency payment in advance of the January monitoring round. That was the, the warning that was given to us. So I thank them for highlighting the issues to us. Uh, and it does appear to me that when I add the sums up, given the explanation by the Minister and the Permanent Secretary, that their estimate in the original October bid does seem to have been fairly accurate. In fact, remarkably accurate, because I've been watching, I uh, had a look at a, um, an electricity bill recently, and the bill changed multiple times in the one uh, one payment period, uh, so it must be very difficult to accurately, accurately forecast such large sums which are required to pump our water around the system and, and indeed to maintain street lighting and, and, and road lights, uh, street lights, etc. So uh, I'm glad that the official indicated how things were. There does seem to be, to me, a, a lack of understanding the rules that apply to a limited company, which is Northern Ireland Water. Should they? Uh, uh, go into the red, uh, and I, it's important that everybody fully understands that. But coming, coming to my question, you've indicated that the department has forgone various monies to, to give some additional emergency payments to Northern Ireland Water. Are we aware what Northern Ireland Water has forgone in order that it can divert money to keep itself afloat? Well, I, I know that um, Northern Ireland Water found um, savings within its. Um, operation of 1.6 million. Um, I don't have at hand what they what that specifically entails. I don't know if my officials have, but I know Northern Ireland Water is due to come up for a briefing with the committee. So I'm sure they'll be happy to delve into those issues with you. Yeah, and it's probably it's probably worth adding um, <laughs> that because we were doing the same, we were very clear that you know we had that expectation of NI Water that any area of expenditure that could safely be diverted somewhere else that must happen because. Frankly, that's what they, the minister and her department were doing as well. Okay, and, and I fully understand uh, your priority to fresh water as yeah. opposed to sewage systems. Presumably, if a sewage network were to, were to break down, you couldn't subcontract uh, others to come in and fix it. You didn't, they wouldn't have had the money to do it. That's the sort of things that could have could have happened. Um, in, in terms of DVA, I see that there was a uh, resource pressure of some eight million. I, 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 I'm just looking a further uh, explanation of that, and the department has uh, passed some um, eight, eight million in capital budget across to allow them to juggle that. But uh, I'm just surprised that they are under resource pressure because my understanding is they're working at full capacity. So I would have thought they should almost be at maximum income at this stage. So what was the cause of the eight million resource pressure to uh, DVA? Susan? Yeah, I'm happy to pick that up. Um, oh, Jeremy's, Jeremy's, Jeremy's here, here as well. He's here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Take it easy. Quietly. <laughs> Take your pick. Um, no, uh, certainly, uh, Roy, at the, the start of the uh, financial year, the impact was on we were not back to full testing capacity, so the large proportion of that is to do with the uh, loss of vehicle test uh, income and also then associated costs um, with uh, you know, providing additional services over time, temporary examiners, you know, everything that we did as part of our recovery programme to increase uh, service delivery for driving tests and vehicle tests. But you're absolutely right. I mean, vehicle testing income has certainly increased uh, since we got back to uh, our normal testing times. Uh, so the vast majority of that was through the early part of the year when we weren't doing a full testing regime. The other aspect of, of financial pressures on DVA and indeed the department is how we choose to regulate and require uh, actions to be carried out. Uh, and I noticed in, in GB that they dispensed the small trailer testing, uh, and they have also not included uh, the Tax Act covering uh, wedding and funeral cars. So there's areas they've chosen not to regulate, not to uh, pose unnecessary burden uh, on the community, on industry, on individuals and also make savings to the department. So they have made those choices. 
why have we not followed those similar choices in order to live within our means and to reduce the burden <coughs> on the public, given the very limited risks that would flow from changing those? Thank you, Roy. So, in respect of the, the trailer change in GB, we actually became aware of that change after the public announcement, which, again, I find disappointing because our officials do work very well with their counterparts in, um, in DFT. Um, and it was in response to the challenges with the haulage industry. Um, and it was trying to uh, address the issue of testing. Here um, in Northern Ireland, testing isn't one of the difficulties cited by the sector in terms of the challenges facing the industry. Um, the RHA carried out the Road Haulage Association, had carried out a survey and identified um, retirement, Brexit and changes to off payroll working as the three challenges hitting the sector. Uh, and so DBA um, is carrying out significant testing of our LGVs, for example, in the full seven months since testing was resumed. It's carried out 42,051 driving tests, which is 42 per cent higher than the five-year average. So that's for LGVs. Uh, but we do keep the, the situation under review. And I suppose what we would need to be clear on is any safety implications for that change, given that it's not um, specifically deemed to be a solution to, to the challenge facing the haulage uh, industry. In respect of wedding and funeral cars, you'll know that they were included within the Taxi Act, um, and I have received multiple requests for changes to the Taxi Act um, from multiple uh, different sectors within the industry. Um, what I believe we need to do is to have a comprehensive review of the Taxi Act. Unfortunately, given uh, the remaining time left in the mandate uh, and the pandemic, it hasn't been possible to carry out that review. But I think in the new mandate, um, there should be a comprehensive review of the Taxi Act taken forward so that we look at the wedding car industry, uh, the funeral sector as well, uh, as well as some of the other issues that have been identified by individual taxi drivers and different organisations in the sector. It's been explained to me uh, that because funeral and wedding cars are used for on a very limited period in each day, it's increasingly difficult to pay for drivers and even to That's get right. drivers. Yeah. Uh, and unless we address it, we risk actually not being able to service the community in providing such vehicles for weddings and, and funerals. And those who have actually invested in training get qualified drivers. They then, having got qualified, go somewhere else where they have full-time employment. So, so okay. the system is not working. Will the Minister uh, initiate a review so that the consultation perhaps could be uh, ongoing uh, in advance of a, a new Minister taking up the post to try and move this forward? Okay, I think the question. challenge here, I'll be very succinct, the yeah. challenge here is that it will require extensive um, policy development work consultation um, leading to potential legislative change. It's just not feasible, and that's me being very honest, for that work to be carried extensively forward, given the limited time left in the mandate uh, and the multiple other areas that, the, that officials are working on, and also in respect of trying to still deal with the outworkings of the pandemic. Okay. Okay. Then. Uh, George. Will it come, is it on the budget issue? Or would yeah, it's the budget. Fine, in terms of the capital budget, um, um, it would be useful if we had the detail behind the capital budget. Uh, one area of particular concern I've uh, regularly highlighted is the insufficient funds directed towards uh, roads planned uh, resurfacing. Uh, uh, and it would be useful to know how those figures that are being um, produced, what it actually means yeah. on the ground. Okay. Um, uh, and I, in particular, uh, the A6, the, the, there's a difficulty around the uh, Mubai site, which is preventing the completion of, of the A6. So uh, 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 how is that going to be overcome? And is it being bid for? Um, and, and where is it in the planning process? Because it's important that these roads are completed. So just in respect of the A6 and the completion of it, you're right to identify the Maboy site, but there's also a challenge that we need to have funding for to take that um, part of the scheme forward. Just for the committee's information, um, I did submit um, the A5 and the A6 roads, um, including phase two of Derry to Dungiven, the inclusion of that route in my submission to the UK Connectivity Review. Um, because I recognise the importance of it and also I want to ensure that we can maximise the potential for funding um, for the, that final stretch of it. So just to, to ensure that members know that I did make that submission to the UK Connectivity Review to make them aware that this is a key strategic um, corridor that I think that they should be looking to work with the executive on. Okay. And are you bidding in terms of the, the railway line uh, under the UK Connectivity Review? 
Yeah, so in terms of the UK connectivity review, I did engage with Sir Peter Hendy. Uh, I was very clear in terms of the NDNA commitment because there are huge infrastructure commitments there that we've yet to see realised in terms of the financial support that the government had committed to. But um, as well as the A5A6, I did um, submit the um, high speed rail link to Belfast to Dublin, extending that to Derry, Limerick, and Cork, and also improvements to the A1. Okay, thank you. Finally, on this session on budget and January, George Robinson on this particular section, and then we'll go to current issues for members. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair, my, my question will be around the regional uh, strategic tra transport plan, and I don't, I don't know if you want to take that now or not. I can the, take it. The yes, going to be yeah. involving some local issues. Okay, do you want to have you a broad question around that first aspect, and then we'll take you in on the current issues in the next session? Um, it's in, <clears throat> in relation to the, the Valley Kelly bypass in my constituency and the Gord Corby Scrinum lane in my constituency. Yeah. Um, Any time that we make representations on behalf of those two projects, uh, we're told that uh, the Minister's waiting on the Regional Strategic uh, Transport Plan. I was just wondering where, where that was at the, at the moment, which is um, <clears throat> stopping those two very, very high demand uh, projects. In her area. Okay. And um, the member does raise with me on a, on a very frequent basis the Bally Kelly bypass. Um, and what yes. we've been trying to do is to situate any further capital projects within, uh, as you've rightly identified, the Regional Strategic Transport Plan tran or Transport Network Transport Plan. So um, I'm due to be getting a presentation on um, some of the um, initial findings of that study. And then once I have that considered, Mr. Robinson, I'd be keen that that goes out to public consultation so that you and other members and, and the public can feed into that, highlighting what you believe to be the important capital projects and road projects, including, I have no doubt, um, you'll be submitting Bally Kelly Bypass as one of those. Yes, it, it, just, just from the, the Bypass one, Minister, each day that road is clogged. You know, that's, that's the main road between uh, the Mavadi and Londonderry, and uh, Bally Kelly, some days you can hardly get through it at all. Um, that's what's given to us each day and daily, that the sooner we get a bypass, the better. Uh, and as well as that, we have to look at the, uh, the former Shackleton, Shackleton site, which was bought <clears throat> and was there to provide hundreds of jobs. But uh, apparently, according to, to the owner of that site, he's can, he's, has lots of problems, you know, with uh, access in and out of it. And the, the Valley Kelly Bypass would make such a difference to that whole project as well, from a jobs point of view and from an, an economic point of view. Very, very, it would be very, very useful. And I know on the issue of the Shackleton, you, you did write to me um, to raise that, and I had offered yeah. the, the option of a meeting with officials. I don't know if that meeting has taken place on site, but happy again to reiterate the offer of that, if you think that would be helpful, Mr Robinson. It'd be very, very useful. Be very, very useful, Minister. Yeah. Yep. Thank sure. you. Thank you, George. Uh, and can I ask, just as that is finished, could I ask officials and indeed the Minister to respond to any further questions on the Budget uh, 2022 to 2025 in writing, which will happen form the Committee's okay. yep. deliberations. Finally, uh, and coming on now to, to current issues, and I, I know the Minister has mentioned many of them actually throughout the briefing, which was related to uh, the funding. And I suppose, Minister, as and I, I know you, you talked of a two-year in office uh, and give your, your broad plan, and members will raise their own in, in, uh, issues specifically. But I suppose there has been ongoing concern, both in the wider sector and indeed through the, the issues that are brought to the committee, that the model itself is in many ways broken. There is, there is continual questions being asked as to, to how it is, is, is the operative, uh, operative model for the Department for Infrastructure broken. And I'll, I'll give you a sense of what I mean by that. So, A5 delays, A6 delays, ARC 21 decision delays, North South Interconnector delays, York Street, Street Interchange delays, planning applications and consultee responses delays, roads resurfacing contracts delays. You know, I could go on, and I know that members have raised other points, but there is a worrying theme. And, and I suppose, probably, Minister, some could conclude, and indeed many in the industry have concluded, that DFA, DFI delays for infrastructure. And delay has meant huge spiralling costs, particularly on massive road infrastructure projects, where there has been significant finance 
and, and not, not a, a, a sod of uh, grass turned or a blade or a piece of tarmac laid. So I would ask the Minister, you know, looking at this, do, do these issues concern the Department and does, does it concern the Minister? And essentially, what is the suggestion on how we can get things back on track in relation to these massive pieces of infrastructure? We only had to listen at the beginning of the meeting, and we placed it in record too, about those horrific uh, deaths on the A5 and you know, the number of accidents that there has been, and not only on that project but indeed others. These are projects that could transform Northern Ireland. We know that there is investment in Northern Ireland that has effectively turned itself away because of the protracted system, both in the planning aspect, but indeed in the length of time that it takes to deliver huge, massive projects, which have the ability to change Northern Ireland as a whole. So I just wanted the Minister's comments on these issues and how she feels that the Department could resolve them for the betterment long term. Many of these issues will not be resolved, in fact, probably all in this mandate. It's a long term uh, theme, which I would like the Minister to address. Yeah, and all the projects that you've cited have actually predated me, yeah. um, and that's an indication of the difficulty. They also, we had three years without any ministers in post. That has had a huge impact. Um, and the other issue is, even in, I think, in almost all of the examples that you have cited there, Chair, they've been subject to legal challenge, and that necessitates then a, a protracted process, and people have to have the right to be able to challenge something. Um, but I think that we do need to look at the system that we have in place, ensuring that people do have the right. But in my view, looking at the issue of vexatious challenge, for example, and the executive had begun to have an initial discussion on this uh, when the executive was formed back in January 2020. Um, but then the pandemic took over, and to my knowledge, there hasn't been any further discussion on that particular issue. But for me, we need to, right across the north, get better at strategic planning, having a vision for what we want in terms of our economy uh, and our society and our environment, and making sure that we have efficient planning and effective delivery of that. That's why I've been pushing for the establishment of an independent infrastructure commission here in Northern Ireland, because I believe that that will be a game changer. It's bringing in experts. It's about setting out a 30-year vision of where we want to be in terms of our infrastructure, and not just infrastructure in terms of roads. I mean digital connectivity. I mean housing uh, infrastructure in, in its widest sense. And the key part of the Infrastructure Commission would also have the public engagement piece, which is really important in terms of setting out to the public why we're doing something, why we've prioritised this infrastructure project, but also having the discussion with them about prioritisation and making sure that they have their views. I'm really pleased that I managed to secure the Infrastructure Commission as a commitment within the COVID recovery strategy published by the Executive. And a cross-departmental working group has been set up, led by the Executive Office, and um, it is anticipated that that group will make a recommendation to the executive for our consideration around terms and conditions and so forth of the establishment of an infrastructure commission. It's not a silver bullet, but I think that it is a substantial game changer. And when I look at other places, our neighbours and further afield across the world, you can see very clearly the economic advantages that are derived from having an infrastructure commission. In terms of the planning process, I haven't been shy in saying that there needs to be significant improvement. The committee will know that there's the cross-departmental um, uh, planning forum, which is focused very much on statutory consultees within the department, given that we have rivers uh, and roads. I have been um, pressing officials and we are increasing staffing resource. We have also submitted an inescapable bid to the finance minister and the executive in the draft budget to ensure that we can significantly increase staffing resources so that we can improve our performance as a statutory consultee, given the increase in complexities of applications and the increase in volume. Members will also know that we are engaged in a review um, of the Planning Act, and that's about looking to see what we can retain, amend, appeal um, on that front. And I also have a piece of work that's ongoing around community engagement, and um, because that's really important to the planning process that communities are involved, are listened to, and are engaged. And of course, as well, we have the planning portal, which is advancing the digitalisation and that a kind of more uniform experience across the, the vast majority um, of the councils as well. I've also requested of my officials monthly updates 
on our planning performance in terms of our statutory consultees, because I recognise the importance of this issue, and we need to be very much focused on, on improving it, improving the quality of applications that come forward to the department, um, and making sure that, um, as well as improving the front end, that we also have the staff and resources, whether it be roads, rivers, NIEA, or anything else, so that we are significantly improving things for people. And I know, and the minister has noted on this point, delay has meant costs. Do, do we have an indication of, for example, uh, how much money has been spent on York Street interchange by the department? I don't have that figure with me, but I've answered it in AQ, yeah. so I'm happy to, to provide that to so the how, how, maybe department officials, know many, how much on the A6? The A6, um, I think we've, we've provided previously to the committee, yeah. but the A6 is um, on track for completion in, in the timescales that we've previously provided to the committee. Really. It's, it's actually been really impressive, Chair, the progress that has been made. We were really worried at one point when COVID struck and new safe systems of work um, had to be put in place that there could be delays, but um, a lot of those delays ground has been made up and we're, we're on track for the flagship phases of, of the A6 as we speak, and that's, as, as you referenced, following um, some years ago legal challenges um, that the, the department was successful in, in defending uh, and delays associated with those. Given the issues that the Minister has noted on in terms of planning, and this committee has taken considerable interest in particularly on statutory council tea times, those actually under the, re the remit of the department are of particular interest to this committee. The review of the Planning Act, where are we with that? Are we going to see progress? Are we, go are we going to get mm -hmm. sight of that before the end of the mandate? Can yes. the Minister give us an update? Yes, <laughs> you will. So I've been given um, a preliminary presentation on the recommendations. I've asked officials to go and look because um, I think that we can maybe go further in some of those. Officials are now carrying out that piece of work. They will bring the final report to me and then we will be bringing that to the committee and I would hope that you will be in that position within the next couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, and finally from me, you know, at a previous committee meeting, I asked the minister in, in relation to Arc 21, and I'm not saying about what the decision is, but a decision. Will the minister be in a position to give a decision on this particular uh, application uh, before uh, Perda, before she leaves office uh, in preparations for the election? Well, of course, um, I um, have to allow my officials to carry out all of the statutory processes and due diligence, and I've made it clear that as soon as they are in a position to make a recommendation to me, uh, that I wish that recommendation to come up, because I understand that people have been waiting a significant period of time on getting a decision on this issue. I also recognise that it is an issue of huge importance to the many people who live in and around the proposed site as well. And where is the department in that aspect? You've said you've whenever officials are ready to bring that forward. Have we got an indicative time of how long that's going to take? Because given the huge time that it has taken to date. Well, officials are carrying out all of the required work, but I've made it clear that it needs to come up. Uh, when all of the statutory processes have been completed, it would be inappropriate of me to say to officials, I want this up in this in X time, because obviously it's a live planning application. Um, but it, I think it's in everybody's interest that we get a decision on this at the earliest possible opportunity when all of the statutory processes yeah. have been completed. And I suppose, as a committee chair, I'm interested in what is outstanding to prevent uh, this going forward to the minister for a decision. Uh, you know, where, where are we in that? Because I suppose it's a, it's a bit in the dark from everyone else's perspective as to, you know, how, how far are we along the road in terms of being able to present this to the minister for a decision based on the evidence that has been provided. Yeah, and a huge amount of work, Chair, has been done um, and a huge amount of, of liaison with, with stakeholders and, and others, and I don't um, expect that it will be a very long period. But like the Minister, the last thing I could afford to do is, is to put any part of the process under any pressure. It, it has to be done efficiently, it has to be done correctly, and I'm absolutely assured that that's what's happening at the moment. Okay, well, that's something that we'll keep an active eye on. That's enough for me. I'm going to go to Cara Hunter's quest supplementary first, because I know she did ask it in her original question. The minister is probably ready to respond as in relation to free public transport, I think, was people. the question. So I'll allow the minister to respond to that and then give Cara a chance to come back on it. Sure. Yeah, so um, I am aware of the, the motion that was passed by Belfast City Council to extend free travel to all young people, and I'm very conscious of the strides that they're making in Scotland in this regard. I would very much like to be in a position to extend the concessionary fare scheme 
Um, for me, it delivers multiple benefits. Um, it attracts people onto public transport. It also makes it much more um, affordable because uh, a lot of people, particularly at this moment in time, are really struggling to make ends meet. Um, and I'm also very conscious that it's important in terms of um, connecting um, our citizens to different services, be the hospital appointments, to jobs and so forth. So certainly it's not uh, a lack of ambition, but the reality is it's a lack of funding. Um, the current concessionary fare scheme is underfunded um, as it currently stands, so we would need to see significant increase in the allocation to enable any expansion of the scheme. But I am working um, with the Finance Minister um, and others because I do think that we can maybe take a staged approach to this, and certainly for me a key group would be those who are already on the half uh, concessionary fare with disabilities. I really think they have a very strong case in terms of qualifying for um, the full concessionary um, fare, so that's something that I'm continuing to work on. Okay. Karen? Thank you, Minister, and thank you for the detail. And just on that, with regarding young people uh, and on the topic of engagement, um, can I just ask a question on, I've seen you've brought forward a number of ways to engage with the public, and one of that being the Youth Assembly. Can I please get a, an update on this and what further steps your department is doing to reach out to young people and the wider public? So I think engaging with the public in a very meaningful way, is, meaningful way is really important. And I think it's even more important now at a time where politics is seen to be extremely toxic. And people have little to no faith, let's be honest, in politics or politicians. Um, and it's not served by what's currently taking place in respect of COVID parties being held all over the place while people were making huge sacrifices. So in that respect, that's why I've been pushing the Infrastructure Commission. It's expert-led, but a key component of its work would be engaging with the public, having those conversations. And for me, uh, our young people are extremely important. I'm conscious that as an Infrastructure Minister, I make investment decisions that involve huge sums of public money, but also determine the infrastructure uh, and the opportunities derived from that infrastructure for many years to come. So I think a really important voice to have in those deliberations and in those decisions is our young people. We've been exploring a number of models in terms of how best to take the youth um, infrastructure assembly forward, but I would hope to be in a position shortly to make um, a further um, announcement on what form that may take. I'm very keen that we get that up and running um, before the end of this mandate. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Cara. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll ask members, we're trying to make the half 12 deadline for the minister, so there'll be a guillotine, but we'll keep it going as succinctly as possible. So, David Hilditch, Andrew Muir, and then Patrick Delargy for. Thanks, Chair. And uh, I'll bring Germany in here since she's having a quiet afternoon in the back of the sir. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. So far. MOTs, there, there still seems to be. Very little movement in the backlog. They're still getting complaints in relation to the DSM. Where, where are we now with the situation since your last visit? I think since the last visit, um, David, we have published another two sets of monthly figures, and it shows that the amount of MOTs that we are delivering has increased. And in fact, in December's figures, I think it was the highest uh, number of MOTs we've delivered since uh, December 2014. So it does uh, show a positive move uh, in the right direction. Um, we have opened up the system, as far as I understand, up to the end of April, and the new booking and rostering system has enabled people to move around that system much more easily. Um, so we find that if they can't book an MOT before their due date, that they are able, with the release of uh, short-term appointments and cancellations, to bring their dates forward in many cases. And I expect that if we continue with the same progress that we've made in terms of delivery, that we would see waiting times uh, slowly and steadily reducing. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that update. Uh, to Minister Ricky, in coastal flooding, mm -hmm. there is a scheme out there in relation to assistance uh, from the department in relation to coastal flooding, but unfortunately that scheme is dependent on the property having actually flooded in the interior. Uh, I'm dealing with some cases in relation on Belfast Lock there, whereby there's people with three foot of water outside their front door, and it's coming so close, but there's a stubbornness or we just don't seem to be able to get through to the department of common sense, whereby a scheme could be implemented to save future flooding, even though that property hasn't flooded to date, though it sits with in the middle of a dam, basically, whenever there's heavy rain or overflow. Would there be an opportunity to look at the criteria again for that, 
yeah, well, scheme? Well, I mean, uh, there is the flood re and the insurance scheme and so forth. But what I'm happy to do is, if you want to write if, uh, to me with the specific mm -hmm. details, then we can give yeah, you a we'll comprehensive be response. Doing myself and, uh, John Stewart are actually dealing yeah, with it. Okay. We'll be writing with you for some videos and that. Okay. But it's just to have a look at that criteria okay. again, and it's more to be preventative and use common sense rather than. Black and white, as it were, you know. So, it's, respect, okay. it's, it's the particular um, approved conditions of, of the, mm. the scheme as, as it Amy, exists at the moment. Yeah, they actually got Amy to do a report on it, which mm -hmm. probably cost as much as the prevention scheme yeah. cost, which is <laughs> amazing, you know. But anyway, yep. uh, other things then, just the, on the capital projects, obviously the one that irks me the most is again the York Street yeah. interchange. Uh, I know the chair has alluded to it there in his list. But basically, it affects North Belfast and every constituency north of North Belfast, and it really is frustrating that it's been hanging around so long now since it did come through a legal process some time ago. And yeah. you would have thought at this stage, potentially, there could have been some movement on that. Yeah, um, and, and I remain fully committed to York Street Interchange. It is a strategic project. You're right, it was subject to challenge on procurement grounds. Um, you're well um, versed in the history of it. Um, I've received um, a presentation on the findings. If you remember, we carried out the, or we'd asked for an independent review of it, and there were six recommendations that I accepted in full. And there was a piece of work to be done around place shaping uh, to make sure that we were future proof in this scheme and um, that it was sitting with executive um, policies but also kind of the bolder Belfast vision but it also importantly worked for the communities who lived around it mm -hmm. so that piece of work is being finalized um, and then i'd hope to be in a position to decide on next steps but that's taken some time because those you, you accepted those six recommendations it must be over a year ago now maybe more yeah, well, I got the presentation um, from the consultants. Um, I think it was just in the lead up to Christmas, either the week or just the week before Christmas. Um, so I've said to them, go away. There's an additional piece of work to do. Um, and I want them to engage with very succinctly and sharply, engage with some of the stakeholders, the local stakeholders and others that we did engage with originally so that they can see what the intention is. But I very much recognise the importance of this and I really want to push ahead. Um, I suppose for me the fundamental thing is, you know, we're investing significant amounts of money in infrastructure and going back to actually the point that the chair made, sometimes these designs need to be looked at afresh in case they are outdated because the context has very much moved. So it's how you can look at those things, making sure that they're fit for purpose, that you're future proofing them um, and then get them uh, move forward as quickly as possible. Well, so hopefully we get an announcement pending sometime in the future. So, yeah. uh, just a quick one there on the glider. There obviously there's been media attention at least the antisocial behaviour on the glider, and people now going back to the conventional buses, whereby not maybe using it the same uh, because of the safeguards of the conventional bus. Have you had any discussions with Translink surrounding the latest media attention on antisocial behaviour? Yeah, and I, I want to say that you know condemn again the attacks on our um, frontline transport workers. Um, one of the very recent cases was um, a frontline worker um, had someone, a youth, spit in his face, which is con extremely concerning considering we're in the middle of a, a pandemic that's airborne. Um, so to condemn that and to put on record my appreciation for the staff. Um, the department and TransLink have been working with the PSNI on the safer um, travel unit. Um, so that's a unit within the PSNI who work with TransLink to ensure that uh, passengers and obviously our staff as well are operating in a safe environment so they can be called and deployed to situations um, that are proven to be very difficult but the onus here is on people using our public transport network to show respect to our workers and to not be abusive um, and they're the people who are responsible for this so of course we'll continue to work with TransLink and I think it's important that we support the unions and our frontline workers um, as well, but the onus is on those who are attacking and abusing our frontline workers, and it's a disgrace that they are putting our workers at risk and under abuse, but also that it can potentially act as a deterrent to other passengers, given that the experience on the glider is a very enjoyable one when you're travelling and has proven to be very successful um, pre-COVID, certainly, in getting people, new passengers, onto, onto the glider and away from their cars. Yep. Okay. Well, hopefully that message gets out. Uh I'll leave it at that. Lord. Okay, and I know um, the vice chair. We we did raise privately in relation to the taxi entrapment issue, and I know the minister has offered a, a closed session on that. Yes. So very much the committee would would like to, yep. to take up on That's that no offer, problem. Uh, given the sensitivities of the case. Okay, uh, 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 sorry, Andrew Muir, and then Patrick Lord. Uh, thank you, chair. I will just reiterate the points around MOTs. A lot of people are contacting me. They're getting the reminder letter, and they aren't able to get their MOT booked before that expires. And that has implications around. Border tax and stuff like that, yeah. so I think it's important 
everything's done to ensure that when people get their letter, they have to look back and get it one uh, an MOT for the expiry of their MOT and yeah. issue. Just round the review of the plan act, I welcome your commitment to, to be bringing something to us in the next number of weeks. Yeah. Just want to see from yourself. Will this be ambitious? Will this listen to some of the feedback that's came through around our planning system? Because from my perspective, our planning system isn't fit for purpose. We need a modern planning system which um, safeguards the environment, but also econo uh, enables economic growth and also addresses the challenges arising from um, the cl climate crisis we face. So, will it be ambitious? And if necessary, will it be proposing legislative, sorry, legislative change? To, uh, to enact those changes that are required to make the planning system better, because the delays in getting approvals here are mm -hmm. atrocious. And the last one is just really in relation to reservoirs legislation. So finally, TEO moves the motion, and you have now got the uh, responsibility for this. Is everything being done to make sure that all those relevant aspects of that legislation are being enacted ASAP? Because we're really we're quite far behind here in terms of getting that reservoirs legislation uh, up and running here in Northern Ireland. That's not through the fault of the officials. That's because this assembly didn't sit for three years. But we've now got the responsibilities transferred, and we need to get it enacted. Thank you, um, Andrew. In terms of the review of the plan and act, so it was never intended to be a fundamental review. The terms of reference were um, that it would look at the operation um, of the plan and act, and it would look to see, um, you know, what um, could be amended. Uh, retained um, and appealed. In terms of it being, and I want to thank the committee for its engagement with my officials on that, and officials have worked to incorporate, where possible, members' feedback on that. In terms of it being um, ambitious, um, it, it has listened. Now, I'm, I'm caveating this with it's not the final report uh, as yet, but it has listened to the feedback from stakeholders. Um, the final report is likely to contain legislative changes and, of course, send the committee um, in the new mandate, and members will be able to have the opportunity to scrutinise that as it works its way through the um, Assembly. Um, in respect of the reservoirs, um, you are right, it, was, it wasn't that long ago that the transfer of functions was completed. There is the targeted consultation, which actually closes on the 23rd um, of January, so just a few days left. Um, on that, and officials are continu continuing to work to advance what they can, both in preparation for legislative change in the new mandate, but also I have asked them to do pieces of work around grant support um, as well, because this is an important issue that we have to absolutely get to grips with. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And I think the grant support is really crucial, because there is no point in having legislation if we do not have the <coughs> funds to enable it to be actually to happen, because some reservoir owners just do not have the funds to do the work in relation to this. So, thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Patrick Larry. Yeah, uh, so can the Minister provide an update on the A5 scheme when, when the public inquiry goes ahead? Are you confident that the Department has done enough this time around to secure um, that it will get through the inquiry this time? Yeah, uh, and just to you know, um, reiterate again the importance of this, and I think we're all given a stark reminder of that project with the, the tragic loss of life um, on the 27th of December, and then Aaron on the 7th of, of December. It's something I'm very conscious of. Um, so, um, as previously advised, officials are working through the um, environmental statement addendum so that we can get that out to public consultation, uh, with a view to it going to the PAC later this year. Um, obviously, the date of the PAC is out with. You know, the gift of the department, but I want to reassure you and others that officials have already started talking to the PAC and have been in discussions with them to ensure that we can get a swift date so that that can move to the reconvened um, public inquiry. And then it will move to um, a, a minister for a decision, um, as you know, but I think I had said in my opening remarks, um, subject to no further legal challenge. Um, we still are on the anticipated time frame of the 2028 completion for construction, and certainly I have been saying to my officials that that is the timetable that we absolutely must continue to work to. So, so just pending uh, obviously a positive outcome of that 2022 or 2023 for the start of the works? Um, so start of works would be 2023, because obviously we have to move to the reconvened public inquiry this year, and that process has to take its course. But certainly um, we still are on course to have construction commence on 2023, with anticipated completion on 2028. But I have to caveat that by saying that would be without a fourth legal challenge. And you will know that this particular project has been subject to three separate legal challenges. Yeah. And, and just around delivering vital roads, particularly to Derry in the North West. wonder, could you give me an update on the progress of the A2? 
Yes, so Cran actually. Um, so the A2 Bancrana um, Road. Um, we're moving to the publication of the draft um, statutory orders for consultation later this year. And of course, we have also been working with local stakeholders as well. So that work is advancing. Okay. Just one final point then around the rail strategy. I know it's due for completion um, at the end of this week, and I welcome the review. Um, but it's, it's the time now for action to be needed. When Chris Hazard was in office, there was the hourly service to Derry within one year of him taking office. I wonder can we expect any commitments from the department um, as to similar announcements, particularly around the commitment to deliver phase three? Um, so that that's the Derry to Coal Rain upgrade, is phase three. Yeah. So um, uh uh, the phase three business case is being worked on and we've been engaging with Into the West, which is a group I know that you're very familiar with um, on that. Um, in addition to phase three, you'll also be aware of the feasibility studies into the additional rail halts, the three additional rail halts, park and rides, but also the move to the half hourly service um, between Belfast and Dublin. Um, and I would re- expect that that work would be completed um, in the spring. Um, as well, so we're we're working towards that. Um, but again, this will fundamentally come down to finance um, and making sure that we have the finance to be able to expand rail connectivity, provide the additional rail halts, and um, also enhance the frequency of service to the northwest as well. And that's why I would encourage people, if they haven't already done so, to feed through to the public consultation on the All Island Strategic Rail Review, which closes at 5 p.m. this Friday. Okay, so just just to clarify one point, are there going to be any further commitments before May on, on the dairy line? Yes, yeah, so I have committed to doing everything that we can to ensure that all of the development work business cases are all in place so that a decision can be reached in terms of um, investing in those. I will take that as far as I can, but fundamentally this is going to come down to how it's going to be financed in the next three-year budgetary period. But I can give you an assurance that while I'm the Minister, I will continue to push for rail connectivity in the North West and, and right across the North. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I go into Cahill Boylan, please. Thank you, Chair, and thanks again, Minister, for your, for your answer. Just a quick day, a couple of points. I've written you in relation to Irish language signage on, yes. on public transport, and I mean, you've indicated this 4%. I mean, moving forward, I mean, can the Minister give a commitment to increase that or, or engage the Department to ensure that that's increased, I think, you know, more visibility? I mean, I'd, I'd like to encourage that if we can, and I'd like the Minister to take that on. Um, in terms of the Loch Nea partnership, now I know. With responses back here to the depart- uh, committee in relation to roads and remits, but I mean there's huge potential out there, and I mean I know it's a cross-departmental issue, but I'm just wondering is there an opportunity for for the this partnership or the remit of it to be taken into Waterways Ireland, or would the minister to commit to looking at how the department can take more responsibility and work along all the departments to develop the huge potential that's out there for. Lockney itself, tourism and everything else. There'll be huge benefits out there as well. No, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, even though. No, go on ahead. Take no, go on ahead. Sorry, that. apologies. Yeah, and the other one then is obviously the roads maintenance issue. I mean, yeah. I, I know, I understand how in the industry that there's no new additional contacts been issued, obviously because of the legal challenge, but also um, there's been nothing taking place now or anything till after the, the end of financial year into the new financial year. So I'm wondering. Is there any way of plugging that gap in terms of extending context? Yeah. And, and also, um, originally the, the structural maintenance was $120 million, and I believe there was $80 million used. I mean, mm-hmm. or is, that, is that correct? Is, mm-hmm. is there a shortfall now, or has that whole amount of money, is it going to be used in terms of structural maintenance? Or is there a gap there? Can you give me an assessment? Yeah, yeah. Okay. sure. So on um, the Irish language, um, it's absolutely right that the Irish language has visibility um, and that um, Irish language speak- speakers have access um, in terms of services. Um, we've taken forward a piece of work in terms of the glider in West Belfast, but we absolutely should be doing much more. I'm frustrated that we haven't seen progress on Acne Gaelica, um, as was promised, because I think that given the legislative un- un- um, underpinning to the language um, and the um, corresponding resource that would come from it would enable us to do what is right in terms of the language, not just in my department but across all government departments. And I'm hopeful that that legislation um, is brought forward as it was committed to. In terms of um, Loch Partnership, I suppose the challenge here, Cahill, is that my department has limited powers 
um, and discretionary powers. There's also challenges around the finance, and we've talked at length in, in the committee about that, and particularly going forward over the next three years. But I have been very clear that I'm, I'm up for working with the Loch Ness Partnership, and um, also with the um, Environment and Agriculture Minister um, as well. And I've also um, indicated that I would be very keen to, where possible, support any projects that the Loch Ness Partnership might have that would qualify for the Blue Green Infrastructure Fund as well. So, very keen to see what we can do to kind of provide that practical support. In respect of the um, roads, it isn't a situation that there are no contracts. The, um, as we said, the emergency work is ongoing. The, there's also the Rural Roads Fund um, as well. But um, in respect of the asphalt, phase one, which is contracts for Newry Morning Down, Straban, Macrofelt, Dungannon and Oma, um, are currently out to tender. Um, contracts are expected to be awarded in March. Uh, I had hoped that it would have been awarded earlier, but it was actually the industry itself that had asked for additional time. Um, and, and so we have, we have granted that. But phase two, um, which has gone out to tender, well, will be going out to tender this month, is Armagh, Belfast North, Larne, Carrig Fergus, Ballymena, Derry, uh, and Cookstown. Um, and the remaining two phases are being worked on. They're going to be issued at three month intervals. But what I would say that that's also being supplemented by one off packages as well. So, you know, it, it is frustrating um, that the legal challenges have resulted in this, but officials have been working hard to try to get the phased um, tenders out, but also the one offs as well. What I would say in respect of structural maintenance was I bid for £120 million at the start of the financial year because I wanted to see an increase. Um, as a result of the legal challenges, uh, it hasn't been possible to spend all that to date. We've spent £85 million on our structural maintenance, but I've been very clear with officials that we constantly need to be reviewing that situation and, where possible, increasing the spend on that. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now go to Roy Beggs and then Liz Kim. <coughs> and then Thank George you. Robinson. See you, George. Don't worry. <laughs> I just want to go back to the MOT issue. Uh, Jeremy earlier on indicated that there was record, record numbers of testing in December, uh, and I acknowledge that. But what he acknowledged is also record numbers of applications, and that actually applications of MOTs has increased. It's the balance of supply and demand that is the problem. Would you confirm that it's uh, generally um, three? There are generally most applicants are taking can only get a date about three weeks after their due date, once they receive their notice? don't have accurate figures, Roy, in terms of how long after their MOT. I mean, our, our advice to customers is to book your MOT as soon as you receive your reminder. And at the minute, reminder letters are issuing six weeks in advance of, of uh, the MOT appointment. Uh, the question you raise in terms of December, the application figures were higher than we would have anticipated for um, December, but that uh, was largely due, due to uh, an IT glitch where some reminder letters didn't issue when they should have done. So we saw a spike in December applications, and I would expect that to uh, reduce now as we move into the months ahead. And obviously, the next uh, set of statistics, which are due to be published in February, should you know show that position again. Minister, there's great pressure on individuals seeking their MOT test and concerns mm -hmm. about the ability to <coughs> legally travel to work or, or, or uh, operate, particularly uh, those living in a rural community with no alternatives. So the, the alternative to create the capacity is either more employees, which more are being taken on, or alternatively to remove the spike that is there by utilising either a temporary exemption certificate or the biennial testing, which you've been consulting on in October. Can you give us any update? Yeah, because we're aware there are very few, there are less than one percent of accidents that are a result from mechanical failures, and also that there's lower risk with newer vehicles. So, where are we with biannual testing or temporary exemption certificates, just to create that little bit of space mm. uh, and allow a more normal MOT system to operate? Yep. No, thank you, Roy. So, in terms of kind of the MOTs, and I do recognise the pressure um, on on people. Um, we are um, uh, significantly recruiting um, additional vehicle examiners. In addition to that, um, you know there is um, testing on additional days, so Sundays or, or sorry weekends and later on in the evenings to maximise capacity there. And we're also seeing record high numbers of MOT tests being carried out. In respect of the issue of TECs, 
Um, it is an option that is kept under review, but there are safety concerns because we have issued TECs previously, and so we have vehicles that have, have gone for that length of time without having what is the current position, which is the annual MOT. So we have to factor all of that in, um, and we will continue to do so. But at this time, you know, officials are advising me that DVA has the capacity to conduct vehicle tests and to eat into that backlog. But of course, it's a situation that we will continue to keep under review. But, but can you offer even TECs for those vehicles that were perhaps tested a year ago, that they are not on a two-year wait? You know, newer vehicles, can they, the ones that have been, that have been tested of, of more recent times, rather than those that are maybe approaching two years? I think we've looked at uh, TECs, uh, Roy, in terms of the contingency arrangements, particularly with uh, the potential impact that Omicron might have had on vehicle testing. Now, thankfully, to date, certainly that hasn't, hasn't manifested itself as, as it might have been expected. Um, TECs for certain vehicles, you know, it's, it's been over two and a half years since we've actually seen those vehicles in our test centres, and that is a concern from a road safety perspective. Um, but we have put in provisions, as you know, with the, the police and the Association of British Insurers, um, you know, as a, a temporary measure until such times testing is back to the normal levels. And for those people who have concerns, I think Andrew uh, mentioned earlier on with tax, we also have a provision in place to deal with those as priorities if they cannot get an MOT appointment before their tax dates due. And uh, so far, anybody who has contacted us under those circumstances, we have been able to accommodate an earlier appointment for them. And then the biannual uh, testing yeah. uh, so consultation, which completed in October. Yep. So they um, had a significant response to that um, consultation. I don't think that's come as a surprise to, to many people. Um, and the analysis of the responses to the call for evidence ha is complete. So um, I'm awaiting on further information coming up for officials. Then I will set out the direction of travel, um, and then I'll, um, of course, ensure that the committee is briefed accordingly on that. As I've said in my opening remarks, you know, a decision to move to the biennial testing will require primary legislation. It's not possible to do that. But I have said clearly that all of the exploratory work should be carried out, um, and then it will be for the, the new mandate to decide whether you know, the minister wishes to proceed with that uh, primary legislative change. Okay. In terms of our rail service, uh, then, uh, I'm surprised not to have heard anything of the Notmore line. We already have the infrastructure in place. I think it's signalling that needs renewed, if, if I'm correct. So for relatively little funds, uh, that, that rail link and the stops at Crumlin and Grenavy um, and the link to the, perhaps the airport, that, that can be developed. So why are we not hearing anything of developing it? And indeed, at the same time, services to Larne have been reducing. Yeah, so in, in terms of the Knockmore line, um, I did submit um, uh, I did submit the Knockmore line and reinstatement of the Knockmore line um, to Antrim uh, as part of my engagement with the UK Connectivity Review. So after the UK Connectivity Review um, indicated that there would be twenty million pounds for feasibility studies, and that's right across, so that's England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, not just for Northern Ireland. Um, I did submit the um, uh, passenger rail connectivity to our airports, and I did include specifically in the Knockmore line. I haven't, to my knowledge, we haven't heard anything back in terms of a decision um, in respect of that. Um, but you'll also know, Roy, that as part of the All Island Strategic Rail Review, a key cornerstone of that is looking at rail connectivity to our international gateway, so our airports and our ports. And obviously, that phase is out for public consultation at the moment. So certainly, I recognise the importance of it, and I have been making representations in terms of at least the UK connectivity review and um, to see what we can do in terms of securing funding for the Knockmore line among others uh, and also ensuring that the international gateways is a key element of the of the rail review and how we're going to look at better connecting people to our airports and our, our ports. Okay. And then finally, finally. why have why have uh, the rail link to Larn suffered a reduction in service when you're talking about expansion elsewhere? I would need to come back to you on the specifics of the decision in, in respect of law, and I'm happy to do so to, say, to speak with Translink and come back to you. Okay, and the, the Minister and the officials will know that there is a, a committee motion for the 7th to 8th of February in relation to innovative ways to the, the DVM backlog, so we'll be interested to hear those proposals. That's due to, for debate on the 7th or 8th of February. Liz Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for the answers so far in this section. Just going back I suppose, to, to the um, point around the concessionary fares, and it is welcome to hear that there is consideration um, in terms of moving from half fare to full fare for, for those people with disabilities, something we certainly would support. It's very, very important. 
is there any more detail on that? I mean, is it is it being considered under the multi-year um, budget, you know, as part yeah. of that? Yeah. Yeah, so I've made a bid in the multi-year budget. Um, obviously, there's a draft budget that's out for consultation. I would very much like to be expanding our concessionary fare much further than, than even um, our citizens with disabilities, although it's a key priority for me. Um, so I would welcome support from um, the committee um, on that issue, um, because I do believe, as I said before, that there are multiple benefits to be derived from ensuring that as many people as possible are able to access the concessionary fare scheme. That's good to hear. Um, just a couple other points, Minister, on the, the road safety strategy consultation. Whilst I welcome there have been some increases in targets to improve road safety, um, I was a wee bit concerned to see a, a decrease in the target um, for the reduction of fatalities on our roads from 60 to, to 50 per cent. So, I mean, it seems like a bit of a retrograde step. So, just to welcome a wee bit more detail on that. And is there um, some consideration? Could, could it still be considered? To strengthen that because it's so so important. I mean, it, every member in this chamber has been highlighting roads where there's been multiple fatalities, so it's it's something that should be a priority. And, I, and I'm not saying it's not, but no, no, just in terms of improving those targets. Sure, and and thank you for that. And road safety is a key priority for me, and and the committee's been very supportive of our efforts on um, mobile phone use while driving, um, uh, tackling drink driving um, as well. Um, so I want to thank the committee for that. The road safety strategy it has gone out to um, to consultation, and we're looking at the final. And I'm conscious that Sinn Féin did make a submission, and this was one of the issues that you picked up on. So we're reflecting on that. But I know you maybe have specific breakdown of, of yeah. proposed targets there. So if you yeah, maybe the proposed to... targets. Um, the overall targets in terms of the number of people killed in road collisions, 50% reduction, um, serious injuries, 56% reduction, but 60% for young people, so children aged um, up to 15, and then young people uh, aged 16 to 24, um, both at 60% in the current proposals. Those proposals obviously um, are worked up on the basis of fairly detailed analysis of, of the statistical projections, but also take account of wider uh, UNEU and um, UK contexts and statistical evidence. But the point of having the consultation is, as the Minister says, to get different views and to, to test ourselves on whether those are the right targets, whether they should be more ambitious, um, and then to make sure that the targets and the means and the resources available to deliver them are fully matched up. My final point then, just leading on from that, and Minister, would be no surprise just to raise this in terms of the A1. Um, it was, you know, I've obviously been highlighting it from when I've come into this assembly. It's a very important issue, and it's a very important issue for my constituency. Um, so it was just to see is there any update on the progress of the A1 scheme, where we're at with it, and has the department continued to explore any ways of accelerating that? Because, you know, we're still hearing of, of multiple collisions um, and fatalities on the road. Um, so it is certainly something that's so so important. It is. No, uh, and I completely um, agree. And again, it's you know offer my deepest condolences to the families of all those who have lost their lives along the A1. Uh, but I suppose what families want to know, um, and what members of the public and, and elected reps want to know, is when are we going to see these improvements made? And when it came into post, this was um, up there in terms of the, the projects that it was very clear needed to be moved forward. So obviously the statutory orders have been made. Um, On-site works to, um, for advanced ground and archaeology investigations are substantially complete. And work is ongoing on the economic appraisal at first to move to procurement and preparation of contract documents. Um, I have also said that where possible we need to be accelerating processes and just to reassure you that you know, this was a, a clear bid that I made within the, the multi-year budget as well. Just a, just a final quick one, just on. We have to move going ahead. At, at the right. minute, just just be interesting really in relation to the answer. Um, has there been any anything that has caused any delays to the progress of it, or are we moving on time in terms of what has originally been projected? Yeah, not to my knowledge. I, I suppose the speed with which things can happen largely depends on the funding that's made available. But that's why I was very clear in submitting the bid for the A1 in the multi-year budget. Thank okay, you, thank you, Mr. George Robinson. Time for one question, if you have it, George. I'll be very brief. I have two, uh, two questions. <laughs> uh, the first one is in relation, I mentioned it earlier there, in relation to uh, Bally Kelly. 
the traffic congestion. I was wondering if the, if the Minister could direct some of her um, road, road service officials to have a look at those traffic lights in the village to see if there's any adjustment can be done to alleviate uh, quite, quite a lot of the, t the tailbacks that occurs, particularly at peak, peak times in the village. And the other one, um, Patrick had mentioned it about the rail service from L uh, Londonderry to Coleraine. I was wondering about a halt maybe in, in Ballykelly. And I've been lobbied from time to time about that aspect. If the Minister could have we look at that as well. Thank you. And thank her and her officials for coming to the committee this, this afternoon or this morning. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. See, in terms of the traffic lights, I'm more than happy for my officials to look into that, either attend a site meeting with you or to carry out their own investigation and to feed back directly to you on that. And Bally Kelly is one of the halts that's been included in the feasibility studies as well. So happy to keep you updated on that also. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Minister, I'm closing off on the point on A5, and it's a particularly brief comment. And I'm, I'm not particularly on that stretch of the road, as I know my other members are, and obviously the, the tragedy that did happen. The particular junction, junction in where the accident took place, Garbecki, I understand, has been a, an area of considerable concern for a long time. Is there anything that can be done in the interim? Uh, in terms of speed calming or anything in that particular junction until such times as we do have the upgrade it's just i'm very very conscious that this particular area has been m mentioned by many members of different political parties and the public and i'm just wondering if that has been explored fully by the department yeah, so um, along the, the, the stretch of the A5, there have been uh, a number of improvements, and it's something that officials obviously keep under review. Um, but obviously, following this um, horrific um, accident and tragic loss of life, my officials will be engaging with the PSNI in terms of their investigative report to see what additional works may be required and how we may be able to take those forward in the interim. And I'm just thinking if there's something in the interim we can do before... Yeah. It'll be worth it if we can save a life if, if, if things took a turn for the worse again at that particular junction, particularly if we do have worse weather now coming into the next couple of months. But listen, can I thank the Minister and our officials for your attendance this morning, for your time, and can we wish you all a, a very happy new year? Thank you. Thank you very thank much, Chair, and thank you, members. Thank you, Chair. George is looking on. George, yeah, I can't turn you down. You're the father of the house. It'll be wrong with me. Go on ahead. Oh, absolutely. Chair, I have to leave the meeting now because I have another meeting now at 21. I thought you were meeting in Bally Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> AERC meeting takes place now at 21. Okay, thanks. I think that's going to be scheduled again. Okay, members. Um, that was comprehensive. Um, I know we are going to be big for time. We have 20 minutes to get through this last piece, uh, which is a, a written brief, but I'll ask the Chair or the Clerk to maybe give us an overview of this paper and um, the points that we will have to go through after that. Uh, there's a number of points that were raised in those briefings. Um, obviously, the budget issues, we, we will put questions directly to the Department for answer. Uh, on the wider piece, and in particular in relation to some of the individual issues, if there was particular uh, follow-ups, uh, members can make us aware of that, and we can we can take those points up. But I think that was again a particularly useful session. Uh, so thanks, members, for their indulgence in keeping to the the agenda items. So I'll hand over now to to the clerk for agenda item number eleven, which is the scrutiny of common transport frameworks. And members will find the clerk's cover memo at page one nine seven. Thank you, Chair. Um, now, <clears throat> excuse me, the Minister will be meeting uh, we commence the 31st of January to consider feedback uh, from uh, the Assembly parliamentary scrutiny process, including from this committee. Uh, there were four uh, transport common frameworks, the real technical standards, the motor insurance, the driving licensing and commercial transport and operator licensing for transport. Uh, now, what we're suggesting is that uh, if the committee wants to consider it at this week's meeting, come to a view on each of the frameworks. Uh, the committee will also see that the House of Lords Committee has made certain recommendations as well, so it will be up to the committee to decide whether it wants to support those recommendations and then whether it wants to support the frameworks as they stand or with, with any com uh, caveats. Uh, a re response can then be, a draft response to the Minister can then be 
uh, completed for next week's meeting for the committee's formal agreement, and then that can be forwarded to the minister in advance of her <coughs> meeting. Uh, we can mention the 31st of January. Okay, members have any member a particular comment to make in relation to that proposed way forward and what has been suggested in the clerk's memo in terms of the content? Do you have anybody indicating the wish to speak on this item? No? Chair. Okay. Chair, can we can we take it if if it's possible we go back and have a look if we send stuff through by email and we then get agreement over the next week or two or, or do we need to make do we need to make yeah. um, if there's any other suggestions we uh, I think I, I know in terms one of the time, time pressure on this, are we uh, in such a place whereby we could essentially be coming back on this item next next week? Well, if, if there's two in particular, I think the real one and the motor insurance one is the two main ones, isn't it? That there may be issues with that, that we need to feed into, or is it right across the board? No, I, they, don't think there any, do, I don't think there were any major issues raised in, uh, yeah, during yeah. the evidence sessions, yeah. and I think members were generally content. It's, it's just that if, if there are any issues at this stage, the Minister's uh, meeting on the 30, 31st of January, so a response from the committee would have to be agreed at next week's meeting. Okay. Right, but Chair, but we will do that, and then if there's anything else, we will yeah, I think, feed I th in stuff. Yeah. I think we, we, could, we could be in a position that if there is any issues arising, that we can, we can have them for the next week's committee meeting right. with the intention of a, a letter being formally agreed by the committee at the next week's committee meeting. Absolutely. Certainly, Chair. So would members be content to respond by uh, email if you have any yeah. particular issues? By, yes, by email sorry. on by Thursday evening. Thursday, yeah. evening. Okay, yeah. If that's okay. content, then a response can be prepared on that basis, including members' papers uh, okay. for issue on Friday. Members are content with that proposed way forward. Okay, thanks, members. Uh, agenda item number 12, which is the forward work programme, and I'll draw members' attention to the draft uh, forward work programme at page 211. Uh, members will see. Particularly interesting that we do have NI water coming on the 2nd of February. Um, that will help inform our discussions where we, where we left off today. Okay, so members are content enough with that draft work programme as it sits, and we're working through obviously a continuation for the committee to, to, to have that essential stakeholder engagement that we have to have, and that's going to follow on after a committee. Okay, members, uh, agenda item number 13 is any other business? I have none. Uh, don't, I think we all got. Oh, Les, come on. Just, just one point, Chair, on, on one of the things I raised there around the road safety strategy. I mean, it was just to ask the committee if they'd consider even supporting um, the point I raised around um, reviewing that. Um, Target for uh, fatalities on our roads, from because there has been a reduction from the last one from 60 to 50, and obviously we have made a submission, and I raised it there today. But it was just to test with the committee support, um, asking the department to reconsider that target because I think it is important. Certainly, maybe a bit more detail on it, uh, Liz. And um so the, the target was uh, for um, the, the number of fatalities on our roads. And it was reduced from a target of six, reducing it from sixty percent. So reducing, right? This is going to be confusing. <laughs> reducing um, the number of fatalities by sixty percent, that was the target. But they've they've proposed to, re to reduce that target for reducing fatalities to fifty yeah. percent. That makes sense. Yeah. So it was just I had asked them to reconsider that and try to. Mm. You know, aim higher, basically. Yeah, no, I think it's an important point. I know it's a bit of a tongue twister saying yeah, it. Yeah, because you're um, reducing... Perhaps, maybe, if you want to put that in email, yeah, no the, com the committee can give consideration. I think on a broad principle, I don't see why we wouldn't, but uh, yeah. if we get that in email, then we can, uh, as a committee, I, I, yeah, come to a position if we want to no support for... I, and just if, if you listen to Katrina's answer to um, Liz, it was a case of, um, I think she mentioned, tend in what budgets it was. There. I mean, we as a committee formally have supported, certainly in terms of road safety, and any, any budget was put forward in terms of any monitoring or anything else. We, we never shied away from that element of it because we understand any single death on the road. I mean, we, we so uh, we need to investigate that back again, maybe, if okay. we find that answer. Is, is it the actual strategy itself? Is it across time, those figures in the budget? Because that's the impression I got from Katrina. Okay. We, we would need to investigate that ourselves if that's the case. Well, what we will do is if, if Liz submits uh, what she is essentially looking the committee to support, 
the clerk will look back on the comments made yeah, in no. relation to the road safety strategy and other subsequent budget allocations, and then the committee can make an informed decision whether yeah. or not we want to collectively support that decision with the department. Are me members content with that approach? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, members. I other Chair, are you just going to close now? Yeah, it's just any other business. Yeah. It's, it's just by way of information from what we had at the start of the meeting in relation to that letter from the Minister. Oh, well, we're not, we're not, I can go into closed session for that if you wish. Cause it's, it's just to inform that I've forwarded two letters on to the clerk okay. in relation to PSNI investigating the intimidation and it was no action, there was no intimidation. And the witness who didn't turn up was actually dropped by the uh, PPS as being unreliable. And uh, not credible on behalf of the department. Okay, well that I just want to leave it there. Okay, just we're, we're, for information, just okay for information purposes. I think what will happen is we will be receiving a closed session uh, from the officials, okay. and these issues can all be raised. But it's it's on the record. Yep. Uh, okay, I have no other uh, business. So, agenda item number fourteen: date, time, and location of next meeting. The next meeting will take place at ten a.m. Wednesday, the twenty-sixth of January, twenty twenty-two, in room twenty-nine, Parliament Buildings. Can I thank members and the meeting is now adjourned. Meeting is adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber.